Okay. All right, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, if everyone can please stand, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance and have a moment of silence. <laughs> Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Well, it's good to be back in person for the most part. I know Peggy's joining us remotely, so you got us, Peggy. Good to have you with us. Uh, we'll start out tonight with the communications. Item 3A is the superintendent's report, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Flossie. Thank you so much. So I will start out with talking about some leadership opportunities that our district has had. Ms. Elma Simpson was elected to the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. Uh, we also have the fact that Mary County Public Schools was highlighted uh, with the, the Kentucky Department of Education School and Community Nutrition Office, and that we are also a Kentucky Proud member. So that's, that's something to be really excited about. For teaching and learning, uh, we had the opportunity to participate in a distance learning day for our staff, and that was actually completed on January the 4th. Our staff and our instructional coaches continue uh, to work on a hybrid lesson plan and playlist uh, the counselors are making calls and supporting our families because obviously teaching and learning is not just about paper and pencil but some of those things that they need. Um, our adult ed, uh, family literacy, they actually are working in small groups. So when you think about that, we're talking about some folks that maybe do not have their high school diploma and family literacy is working with our families on parenting and things like that. Our community educator, uh, Nate, Ms. Nancy, is also working with our career testing center. Again, we're wanting to continue to make sure that our students 
um, after high school and our adults have an opportunity with workshops and things to get into the uh, workforce and also she continues to work with our backpack program. Our district is planning a mental health summit in September and we are going to use our local partners also work with our HR directors in the community and also we want to work on that um, at, at a regional level. Uh, we have uh, we have the opportunity to attend a mental health summit in Owensboro uh, in March if all goes well and so that'll give us an opportunity to see what that end of the state's doing with that and how they're incorporating the community. We have been very fortunate to be able to bring in some small groups and even have some lab instruction at the ATC. I, I know that's very different than that what we were accustomed to uh, a couple of years ago, but, but since we are dealing with a global pandemic, excited about that opportunity. Uh, a lot of student support services are offered even on our non-traditional instructional school days uh, for teaching and learning. Uh, we have an item on the agenda. We definitely want to talk to and, uh, and obviously we hope that the community's listing as well is about our re-entry plan and what that's gonna look like. Uh, very fortunate that we have eight students that have been selected for a possible consideration for our Governor Scholars Program. Uh, when we start talking about our six big dreams, um, learning begins at birth. Obviously we are continuing with our library books that are heading home to our students five and under, you can see Positive numbers there, 751 children are receiving books each month and 568 have graduated. I'm not gonna run through all those numbers, but you can see that we have a partnership with several folks in regards to preschool for our three and four year olds. And we're beginning the conversation on what registration will look like for preschool and kindergarten. Uh, under the, the current uh, restraints that may look a little bit different, but we know that that's something that we're, we're already talking about what the next school year is going to look like. Market Connect and Communicate. I hope that folks are following us on our social media page and our website and also our partnership with Lebanon Enterprise, those teacher spotlights and all the things that they're doing to um, make distance learning enjoyable and, and to let the kiddos know just how much they care about them and also that teaching and learning is really important. Uh, Marion County Public Schools, and I wanna say a big shout out to Jason Simpson, uh, the Telling Our Story initiative. That's a statewide initiative that we want folks to understand what schools are doing um, in, the, in their community. We had a number of, of district uh, drive-through events uh, in December. Uh, I don't wanna leave one out, so I'll just give one example. For, for example, uh, West Marion had a jingle all the way and it was just a, a, a drive-through. Um, so excited about that. And then another example of some services that we're offering is our Family Resource Center's offering a, a pantry opened every Thursday. This isn't down, but we also have a community pantry that operates out of 21st century as well. Our Family Resource Centers do an outstanding job with helping connect our community in the event uh, that individuals need something that, besides just that traditional classroom instruction. Our technology, we want to say a real big thank you to Independent Save. Uh, they awarded us uh, a donation that will help assist in Chromebook repairs. As you can imagine, if you pump out uh, over 3,000 devices, there's going to be instances where we're going to need some repairs. And so that's a great way. Um, it's not just about buying the Chromebooks, but you also have to know how to use the Chromebooks, but you also have to think about how do you maintain those and, and the repairs. And uh, we are working on the Rust Grant. I talked about that in December. And just want you all to know that we actually have that uh, set up over, uh, we, we had a demonstration at the high school. It was very easy to use. It worked well with the current boards we had. It's very portable. And basically you're gonna have a camera in the middle of the room, the teacher walks around, the camera follows them around. Right now we're pretty much tied to these laptops at our desk. So hopefully we're gonna be able to partner, uh, write a grant, get some additional technology in and uh, continue to figure out ways to be uh, innovative with, with distance learning uh, even beyond the pandemic. We had some really cool things when we talk about next generation. 
we're always really excited because we know that our students, they are the next generation of Marion County and they're gonna be the next leaders. Our ROTC program did their food drive, their Christmas for kids. I hope you saw that out on our social media. Our high school football team volunteered for the hospital and they helped decorate. I appreciate that work. As you can see, our beta club members knocked it out of the park with several community service projects. Uh, you know, we, we wanna talk to our kids. We're always talking to them about commitment and that's well beyond just what you do in the classroom. And as you can see, another example with Calvary um, competing at the state convention and just wanna say uh, that Tracy Cochran and Devette Mattingly, I uh, just wanna say a big shout out to them and all of our beta club sponsors, coaches, I should say. Graduating students, college and career ready. One of the things that we implemented several years ago was a, a, a different academy for kids that maybe don't go through that traditional pathway. Uh, I wanna say another thank you to our board members for supporting um, a principal in that area, Ms. Holly Cox. And uh, she had a big celebration. We had 15 students that will graduate at the end of this semester and the semester will end on Friday. And so typically those students have some extraordinary struggles that maybe some other uh, students don't. And for whatever reason, their day looks a little bit different. And we know that at a minimum, we've got to have that high school diploma and just want to be a big shout out for that. And they will be invited to participate in a graduation ceremony this summer, uh, similar to what we did uh, in, in previous years. Another example of graduating our students uh, college and career ready is our Project Lead the Way pre-engineering program. Um, Mr. Conley's not gonna allow uh, our circumstances uh, to um, take an opportunity away from our students and also for the community to just see what our kiddos do. They basically invent something and, and they go through the prototype, then they stand up and they present and, and they get judged and things like that. What a wonderful, it's almost like another mock interview for those students. Excited about that. That's going to be next week. If, if anyone would like to participate, there's a Zoom link out for that. For communication, um, our food service ladies do an outstanding job. You can see the number of meals, 127,000 meals served in the month of December. Um, and during the week of Christmas, we gave away Hershey syrup. Each family had a homemade ornament and a handwritten note for child. And so we had talked about, you know, what are some different things that our staff can do in a time when they may not traditionally be doing the same kind of work that they would normally do. And just, just wanted to say thank you and, and hope that our families enjoyed that. We have been on distance learning since October. Um, I do wanna make the board aware and make families aware and we will communicate this, uh, but we are very fortunate to have an opportunity for our sophomores and our juniors to participate in ACT testing at no cost. But because we're doing this and the way that we need to test under these circumstances, we're, need to, we're gonna need to have an NTI day at the high school only for March the 2nd and March the 9th. And so Ms. Murphy is helping coordinate that with the guidance counselors. So that'll be something that we make sure that we let families know. Wonderful opportunity. Um, I can remember being high school principal when we started giving the kids uh, the pre-ACT and, and kids would make these scores and they would come in the office and they had no idea because they never even thought about going to college. And they may or may not go to a traditional college, but just to let, let children know what, what's that like, what, what it's like. And then especially if you take it your sophomore year, then you have an opportunity with some programs we have at the high school to improve your score. And so different kids may work on different kinds of things, but it's a wonderful, wonderful service that we have. Uh, Mr. Lyons and I, uh, when available, when, when the health department is available, we have weekly meetings with the health department and all of the superintendents in the Lincoln Trail area health department. Um, this isn't on my superintendent's report, but today um, we did, we were made aware that Lincoln Trail would not be providing the vaccines to Marion County Public Schools. We were made aware today that that would come from a uh, pharmacist, CVS or Walgreens. Well, as you all know, we do not have a CVS here. We're assuming Walgreens. 
What I want um, our staff to understand is please don't call the health department. If you've got a question, let us know. But please also know that we receive information uh, daily, sometimes hourly, and uh, we are providing you with the information that we are given. I know it's very hard to understand why some school districts are currently receiving the vaccine, but please know that there are several um, uh, districts throughout uh, Lincoln District's health departments. In fact, there's 14 different health department districts across the state and each of those will handle that different. I've talked to superintendents from one end of the state to the other end of the state. Some folks are getting the vaccine this week. Some are scheduled for next week. Simpson County and Warren County, they're getting it. Rockcastle County next week. Mayfield Independent was told they may not receive the vaccine until the end of February. Uh, Mason County on the other end of the state We've got, we've got to just get it set up. And then today it was announced uh, that the governor said that we were gonna get everyone vaccinated by February the 1st. So we are, we're, we're taking the information in and we will keep folks posted as we are um, given that information. I'm not sure if that means we're gonna go through a drive through at Walgreens or if we're gonna go to the gym over here at the high school, but we will work with the provider um, but it, it is going to be very important that if a staff member is given an appointment, they must show up. There is no rescheduling. You could have to take your vaccine during the day, in the evening, or on a Saturday or a Sunday. So we will work with that provider to get these vaccinations um, as quickly as we can for those staff members that have signed up. Um, believe it or not, we've completed 80 days and we only have 86 more days. Um, I can't believe it's the middle of January and we're going to look up and it's going to be spring break and then we're going to look up and it's going to be time for graduation and then it's going to be time to start school again. So our last day of school, unless something changes drastically, will be May the 26th. And I know one of the things that uh, we will talk about tonight is also graduation a graduation date. So I know we have several items on the agenda and I can wait and talk about those, especially that re-entry plan when we get down to that, unless there's other questions. And if, if, I, if I don't know the answer, we'll find it and we can always talk about it at the next meeting or we can get, get somebody on a Zoom meeting real quick. Okay, any questions? Okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Lawson. Welcome. Next item is 3B, Board Member Recognition Month. So, um, in light of COVID, it is very different, but January is designated as Board Member Appreciation. Typically, we have our county judge here and they read a really nice proclamation, but currently, um, as it's been made public, our county judge has COVID, so he can't be here. Um, it just seems like if you know somebody or you talk to somebody, somebody is either quarantined or they have the virus. So thankfully we're here and, and we're healthy, but we wanted to provide you with a certificate of, of appreci appreciation and I will read it. It's, it's basically that you are a partner in the lives of students that you serve and the community that you are working to approve, uh, improve. The Kentucky School Board Association honors Brad Cox, Terry Truitt, Jim Eubank, Joey Lee, and Peggy Downs. She's not with us, but I just want to say thank you to each of you. There's a lot of information from it, you. You don't live in the school world. I do, um, and, and we do, a lot of us. And so we try hard to make it, uh, put it down in layman's terms, not because we don't know, we, we don't think that you're not uh, super intelligent and Johnny on the spot, so to speak but just that it's just a different world that we live in and we appreciate that. There are so many moving parts to a school system. It's like its own little community. And so we talk about the community that you're improving, the community of Mary Kay Public Schools directly impacts the community around us. So I just wanted to say thank you. And also I wanted to make sure that you have an opportunity to wear the same pullover that each of our staff members wear because you are a part of our school family. 
And in the end, um, that's, that's, that's what really matters is that uh, we, we are a part of a school family and our number one objective is making sure that our students uh, receive the services they need so that they can go anywhere in this world and compete against students. So thank you all so much. And I wish I, wish I could do more. I, I wish there were balloons and cake, but we can't have punch and we can't have cake. So we'll save that for another day in time. If we ever get to have cake and punch, it's going to be a big one, okay? Because we still owe uh, uh, we still owe Joey a, a, a cake and punch for for his uh, recognition, and we still owe Mr. Reed for his service and, and, and Mr. Ford. So uh, there'll be a day that we'll have some cake and punch. So we may have to go outside on the lawn, the Navy lawn, Mr. Bettingfield, to celebrate. So thank you all. All right. Well, thank you very much. We, uh, I think everyone would agree, we appreciate all the work that you and your team and all the members of the MCPS community do to make things go here. Next is 3C, Terrace Metrics Report. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. It's an honor to be here tonight uh, to discuss the process that occurred in Marion County uh, in the fall. And just as a real quick background, I'm William. I'm Rich Kelm, the founder of Terrace Matrix. We are nationwide. Uh, we deliver a behavioral health systems for both um, schools as well as workplace. As I mentioned, my student districts as large as large the students to all as all as a, a, a dozen in the most remote areas, areas of the country. The reason I bring this up is that I had the pleasure of training uh, the, uh, the staff of Marion County in the fall, and I can say without a doubt, and, doubt, and, doubt and, and, and the passion, passion that Marion County has for students, students, students was very clear. Very clear start, start, and I thank several individuals for making not only the training process, but the process itself so well, um, so well regarded. And so uh, certainly Superintendent Schlosser, thank you so much. Shannon Sparkman, the lead school psychologist, as well as Tracy Sharp behind the scenes, they did a lot of work. Uh, this is a very unique system. It's a brand new system. It re it's revolutionizing how behavioral health is assessed, addressed, and, uh, and measured over time. And that takes a concerted effort from a district, especially at the beginning, to make sure that all the moving parks are working uh, well and, and in the right direction. And they did a fantastic job. And of course, the school response teams uh, very eager to learn this new system and embrace this system. But more uh, equally important, the parents who allowed their students to participate in the fall, of which will oh, very hopefully will become a, an occurrence for years to come, and certainly the approval by the Marion County School Board. So real quickly, why are we doing this uh, before we get into the data? There's really no comprehensive way at this point to measure behavioral health. Behavioral health, by definition, is looking at two aspects of our health. It's looking at our uh, personal strengths, the strengths that we need to overcome adversity, as well as the risks that we bring to the table that's precluding us as students from learning optimally and from just functioning uh, behaviorally. Behavioral health is looking at both sides of this. Now, why that's important, as was, was mentioned last year, behavioral health predicts up to 50% of the variance associated with optimal behavior of optimal academic functioning. Outside of mastery of material, how a student sees themselves, how they see their world, and how they see their future directly predicts where they're going to go, not only through school, but in life. And yet there's really no way of doing this in schools until now. That's why we created this in 2018. We've now administered this well over a million times to, uh, to students from grades three through 12. Not only that, this gives an opportunity for school districts to monitor, to not only identify emerging issues if they were to occur, but also to monitor growth in students over time. It's immediate, meaning that once the student uh, completes the 15 minute assessment, those results are going to a specific group within each school. We call those the response teams. Those are the school psychologists, the counselors, social workers, and nurses, as well as uh, some administrators. So teachers don't have uh, access to the uh, to the individual student data. They do have access to collectively the aggregate data, which I will show you tonight. 
And then it's also integrated with community resources as well as our own resources that are provided to schools. So it's not just providing data, that data is directly linked to resources that can be used by teachers as well as members of the response team. It's all empirically valid. We don't see the data. So we are FERPA compliant for schools. We HIPAA compliant for adults. And the great thing about this is the system. So what schools are, um, when they first learn how to use this, like Marion County, they're just tasting the, the, what the, uh, the, the flexibility and the ease of use of this. And as they continue to use it, like any other school, they now start to incorporate some of the things that we offer, as well as other resources that we can bring to the table. So it's really fast, it's just as an overview for the parents who gave permission, thank you all. It's just 15 minutes. It could be done at school. It could be done at home. It could be done in any, um, um, most of them use desktops or laptops and even some students were using phones, not in Marion County, but they can use phones as pot if they'd like and laptops on any operating, it's that flexible. The advantage is, is simply this, it's the districts that get to choose the indicators. Well, we don't thrust any indicators upon them. The, the district chooses the indicators themselves they own the data. We don't see the data. They have access to everything. Um, and not only that, each school receives their own comprehensive aggregate report that can be shared to the educators so that they work in concert to not only identify areas that they could work on for, for the uh, year, but also to measure and monitor over time. It's something for everyone. Real quickly, before you get into the results, we got to talk a little bit about the indicators and the indicators again, are divided into resiliency. Those are those personal strengths and also risk. Now, now the risk indicators are self-explanatory. These are things that most likely preclude a student from truly functioning at the optimal level. And my, what I mean by functioning is how well they're doing in school, how well they see themselves and how well they see others. And so those risk indicators are, are, can be selected. Any one of those can be selected by the schools. Um, and also the resiliency indicators. Now the resiliency, these, we need to have these strengths in place in order, of, in order to overcome any adversity. And of course we live in the COVID society. It's uh, becoming our new normal for lack of a better term. And so we, adversity is our middle name. And yet we know that individuals, students grades three all the way up, if they have these specific indicators in place, these resiliency indicators, more than likely they're able to successfully work through whatever adversity that they're facing. It's when these resiliency indicators start to uh, erode or go away, that's when these risk indicators start rearing their ugly heads. And so that's why schools are choosing us because we're the only company that's actually offering data on both sides of the equation. Anyone can do that. Our bread and butter is here. And I really wanna emphasize this. When a student takes the assessment, again, 15 minutes, they're done. Their placement is gonna be along a behavioral health continuum. Behavioral health is no different than physical health. So it's not a yes, no, or either or. Our health is determined by a number of factors that places us along this continuum from at risk to moderate concern to satisfactory to optimal. These percentages you see up here is normally what you see in schools. So 12% of any school's population is gonna be what we call at risk. They're not gonna have a lot of strengths, gonna have a lot of issues that they're facing. On the other hand, you've got 13% of your population are in the optimal range. And that means they're doing really well. It doesn't matter what adversity they're experiencing, those strengths are intact and they're able to work through the adversity. The majority of schools are in the um, satisfactory range. And then here's another one, it's called moderate concern. These are emerging issues. This system allows student, or schools to identify students who are in the moderate concern, which means that, uh-oh, we're starting to go down, falling down the cliff a little bit. Let's make sure we reach out to them right away to make sure they don't continue to go down into the at-risk range. So this is providing information for every student, not just identifying those students in the at-risk range, you're identifying every student who completes this assessment. Why that is important is simply this. We've collected data on 60,000 students at this point. We've collected GPA, ACT and SAT scores. We've collected in Kentucky state math reading and math scores, and we've collected a whole bunch of behavioral data. This is what we know, is for every step downward in this curriculum, in this continuum, so if a student is in the optimal range versus a student who's in the satisfactory range, on average, GPA decreases 12%, uh, 
state test scores decrease 15%, you have significantly higher rates of behavioral issues, even from optimal to satisfactory. So that everything that we do is validated against actual uh, norms and outcomes that are very important for schools. So here's the participation rates for Marion County. Very good participation rates, by the way, for a, for a district that is just first starting this which really in what we're doing here is trying to make sure that the community understands the beauty of this, a lot of buy-in. And so kudos to Marion County and the community for doing this, for being a part of this. This is the overall functioning. And as I've mentioned, I'm, I'm providing you colors because I think it's a little bit easier to interpret. But again, if you look at these colors, this is the at risk, this is the moderate concern, this is the satisfactory, and this is the optimal. As I've mentioned, every color code is directly associated with uh, academic and behavioral outcomes. And so 13% collectively of your school, of, of your district, are what we call in the at-risk range. Now, the beauty of what we're doing here is that those response teams in each one of these schools, they know exactly which students are struggling. They, so, so the high school response team knows exactly uh, uh, those 15%, which ones are really struggling so they can get the resources to them accordingly. As you're going to go on now, you're going to be able to not only identify those students and get them the help and the resources that they need, but you're going to be able to monitor response to intervention. And that's the great thing about this system is that over time, you're going to see a decrease in the at-risk range. You're going to see an increase in this side of the equation, which is very important. And then in correspondingly, you're going to see a difference in your academic and your behavioral outcomes. So this is what we call baseline. And baseline is very important. But as you go on, guarantee you now, because you're focusing on where you need to allocate your resources, you'll see a decrease in at risk, you'll see an improvement in some of these other areas. So uh, any questions regarding this before I go on? I'm almost done. But I just want to make sure I don't want to go so fast that you lose it but I don't want to go so slow that you lose it. So is there any questions at this point? Okay, so we're gonna go on here. So that I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm breaking it down. Every district or every school has their report. So what I'm, I'm giving you a 30,000 foot view of the reports that every school has. So collectively your elementary school students, what I've done here is I've compared against the fall 2019, so that's pre-COVID. The reason I wanted to do that for this presentation is that is the central question that often educators have, as well as parents have, is how is COVID affecting how my child is seeing themselves? At least for elementary school students, you're gonna see, well, it's, it's positive, it's good. Nothing really has changed for them in comparison to our, our norms. And so, and in fact, um, uh, what I like about this is that they enjoy their school experiences in Marion a little bit, um, a little bit more, significantly more than about 7,000 elementary school students who took this in the fall of 2019. That's a good thing. But there's a breakdown here uh, that walks the schools through, okay, what should we be focusing on to really improve that particular area? And anything approaching 20% would be something that would be considered worth targeting. But well, the one that's approached in 20% collectively in our elementary schools is positive social connections, which makes sense because these students have been in COVID quarantine for so long. So it, it gives a, a good view of how students are seeing themselves in comparison to our, our data. Uh, the beautiful thing about this is that 97% of the students who completed this really felt that they belonged in their elementary schools. They had good relationships with their teachers. This is one of the highest in terms of any district we have regarding of size. So kudos again to Marion County and the, and the elementary schools. Uh, but there are some areas that could be worked upon. And of course, this is the big one. And that makes sense since we are in the COVID. This is the middle school. Um, what we're looking at here, uh, my apologies, that should be middle school. Again, it's comparing against the 2019 pre-COVID sample. Here it's 12,000 middle school students nationwide. We just collected the sample, that's all we're doing here. But as you'll see, the mean scores are quite good. Again, you see a high, uh, higher than uh, what we expect for positive uh, uh, school experiences. You see a little bit of drop in hope, and that's something that we'll talk about. Now hope is this, and this is for parents, um, is that there's a goal, and something is blocking that goal. 
can you come up with strategies to work around that blockage? And are you motivated to do this? High hope students are able to come up with multiple strategies to work around that blockage. Low hope students, they have one or two and they're not very good, they're not very well developed and they quickly give up if neither one of those strategies work. Now, why that's important, hope is one of the biggest predictors of GPA outside of mastery of material. So collectively, at least at the middle school, you're seeing lower means than what we expect from based on the 2019 norms. But other than that, oh, my, my also, by the way, leadership. Uh, leadership is significantly low in the, in the middle school. This is part developmental. Well, what leadership is measuring is specific leadership skills that have been shown to predict success after high school. If you develop these specific skills, more success, you become, on average, you become more successful in getting what you want after high school. And this begins at grade six. So this is a great baseline uh, data for uh, at least the middle school to work on. We can work on those leadership skills. And in fact, leadership is one of the easiest skills to develop. Uh, what I like about this also is that students are connected in the middle school in comparison to our middle school at ages, but there are still some areas that could be worked on And here you see anything close to 20% could be worked on in the middle school. Again, you've got wonderful connections with the schools. This is from the middle school population, but you also, and you've got some great areas here under standards, students hold themselves to high standards. Now, where do those standards come from? They come from the school, but they also come from the parents. They're expecting success, that's beautiful. But there's some other areas that might preclude that from happening, and this is where some areas could be. Hope, again, grit. Grit is that tenacity to stick with something, to not give up and not be distracted by the next shiny object. I will say this is no different than many districts in America. Grit seems to be one of the lower, uh, um, well, the struggles for many of our adolescent students, it might be the society which we are embedded where everything's a shiny object. But the important thing about grit is that if you can stay with something and not give up, you become more successful, not only through school, through your, through your school work, but also after high school. So I, I, this is something, again, three areas to work on would be hope, grit, and positive social connections. Here is the high school data. Uh, I, again, comparing it against, I think at this one, this is 12,000 students in 2019 pre-COVID. Uh, a little bit different profile than you saw over in the middle school, but the same kind of results. Again, you'll see that leadership is one of those things collectively that could be developed, could be honed on. And also the, the positive social connections, a little bit different than what we find in the middle school. That's to be expected considering the age of the students what we know is that as a student, it's kind of a bell-shaped curve. Students become very tight together in the middle school, but what happens as they get older, as they prepare for graduation, the, that tightness starts to diminish. So this is not to be unexpected, but there clearly are some areas that could be worked on at the high school. Uh, and again, I'm showing you here, anything within the 20% or close to, so positive social connections, which is to be expected considering the pandemic. This is the, uh, the depression and the anxiety. And this is something, uh, these are the two indicators that were chosen by Marion County to measure and monitor over time with their students. The blue is the middle school, the red, is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the blue is anxiety, the red is depression. And here you see differences between the middle schools and the high schools on this. I'm also including Hugh Spalding in this one. That's to be expected, these more specialized schools typically are a little bit higher in risk variables, but even at the high school level and the middle school level, uh, you're at the level of anxiety, and what this means is above threshold. What this means is that if one of these students in the 12% was to actually go to a clinic, they would likely get the same measure we administered, and they would likely uh, warrant intervention. So 12% of the high school population had reported above average or over average, uh, over threshold anxiety. One in 10 middle school students are experiencing some forms of depression uh, symptoms. And these are higher among the, again, Hugh Spalding and even Knights Academy. So with that being said, I've given you a very quick overview. I'm just presenting the, the data to you, but this is gonna be tied to interventions. This gives districts and schools the data that they need in order to identify and customize interventions specific to students who fit a certain profile. 
we, I end here by saying this, Terrace Metrics operates under this mantra, that which gets measured gets done. We have now provided data that now allows schools and districts such as Marion County to act upon it. And I appreciate your time. I don't wanna take any more of it. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them or you can certainly contact us offline. Questions? Um, how does this ultimately filter down to parents? I know that the school, it said the information is owned by the school and the individual, I assume the individual is the student. So how do we as a school district then take this information and communicate with parents so that it's kind of everybody working together towards a common end? Rich? Would you like me to answer? I'm sorry. School system and how they're working with parents. I know that in the event that we have a child that falls into that at risk category, that's immediate and they're going to make contact uh, with a parent. Um, and that is the reason why that we have our SEL update following this. And I, I don't want to really, uh, I, I want them to be able to tell you, because I think the way Rich ended it is that we've identified, but the most important thing is, then what, what do you do next? And we have a fantastic SEL team. So Rich, if you wouldn't mind to stay on while our SEL team presents, just because I think the more you know about what we're doing, it's, it's, a, it's a better partnership. Not that I don't think we have a good one, but, um, and I, I do also want you to know that Ms. Sharp and uh, Ms. Sparkman are not gonna be a part of this. They, they wanna give the team an opportunity to shine. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them take over and then, and then we'll go from there if that's okay with you all. You bet. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Jill Edlin. I'm the occupational therapist in the district. But I'm also very fortunate that I get to spend part of my time as a member of the social and emotional learning team. You're also going to hear from Ryan Nicholas, who is our primary social emotional wellness educator, and Madeline Wise, who is our secondary social emotional wellness educator. And first, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank all of you very, very much for all the support that you have given us and that you continue to give us as long as as, as well as this opportunity that you've given us to share some of the many exciting things that are going on in our district right now related to social emotional learning, which you might see as SEL. The board has been very supportive of intentionally increasing our supports for social emotional learning. Our district continues to be at the forefront of recognizing that learning begins at birth, as well as the need to address social emotional learning as a vital component to develop the skills that our students need for the future. The Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, also known as CASEL, has done much research and collaboration around social and emotional learning, and they've developed a framework that incorporates five core competencies, as well as the collaboration of home, school, and community. And this is the framework that we have used throughout our journey to guide us in planning and implementation. Our district SEL initiatives continue to integrate the needs of both the district and the community to intentionally meet student needs. These are just a few of our district initiatives in which we are seeing many positive results. Last spring, the board approved our, dis our district SEL standards based on the competencies to ensure consistent and intentional conditions fostering our SEL growth. Each of our schools have designated a time each day to intentionally target SEL. Our elementary schools are using the Harmony curriculum and our secondary schools are using Habitudes curriculum with many additional supplemental resources to address those SEL standards. Throughout these challenging times, we've continued to see many innovative ways to both incorporate the curriculum as well as implement supplemental pieces to target concerns specific to identified needs. <clears throat> We have also participated in a minimum of two full days of professional development, along with several sessions throughout the year on social emotional learning, curriculum, and supplemental strategies. We also have two full-time social emotional wellness educators. Mariah Nicholas provides supports for primary, and Madeline Wise provides supports for secondary. 
All students grades three through 12 have participated in a mentor survey. And in this survey, they identified three people that they feel comfortable talking to at their school. The staff were then notified of the students that selected them and were encouraged to check in with them during the week. As you've heard this evening, our district has implemented the use of Terrace Metrics and this system has helped us to identify at-risk students as well as intentionally plan our instruction based on those needs. The district has developed a process for threat assessment and provided training to school teams on how to complete that threat assessment process. This year, 38 threat assessments to have been completed to ensure that those students in need have had the appropriate supports. 37 of those threat assessments were completed during those few weeks that we were in person, and 14 of those threat assessments were completed based on those Terrace Metrics results. In addition to focusing on the needs of our students, we recognize the need to address the social and emotional needs of our staff. We have shared many resources with our staff to support their social emotional needs. We've also started a monthly meeting with our mental health agencies to coordinate our efforts both for students and staff. And in regard to our adult staff SEL, our SEL team has sent out a survey to staff to gather information on what they would be interested in for self-care activities. Many noted that they would be interested in yoga, Zumba, book clubs, and painting. There was also many individuals who said that they would be interested in leading one of those self-care activity groups. There are also several different platforms that we're using to share resources with our staff, as well as the community. If you look on the Marion County Public Schools webpage, there is a link to our Marion County Public Schools SEL webpage. And I would like to take the opportunity just to show you that. When we go to our SEL webpage, uh, you'll just see some general information about SEL. And then as we scroll down, you'll see some of the resources that we partner with in our community, the Mental and Behavioral Health Services Agencies. Um, there's lots of numbers there, as well as the suicide prevention. Um, I'm just going to scroll back up. In the upper corner, you'll see that we have um, a link to social and emotional mental health apps and websites, as well as a link to our social and emotional wellness room. I'm gonna click on that just to show you what's available in that room. There are lots of different icons in this room that include hyperlinks. And so if you click on the icons, it will take you to another resource. So it's full of lots of different resources um, for the staff, but it's also full of things that might um, benefit our students. In this lower corner, you'll see that there is a hyperlink for an elementary SEL room, as well as a link to the teen SEL room. And both of those rooms also contain many different icons that are hyperlinked with different resources that are appropriate for both of those age groups. Let me go back to the presentation. Um, there are also many other resources that we share with the community. We have a quarterly uh, SEL newsletter that we send out. And there's also daily posts on our Facebook page and the Instagram. We also are currently in the process of implementing a district staff SEL shout out in which each school would have the opportunity to nominate a person in their building for their SEL contribution. Those who get the shout out would receive an award along with the Maroon Heart button to add to their lanyard to signify their contributions. All of our staff have participated in professional development targeting the curriculum specific to their grade levels. Um, they've also received many different in-person as well as virtual strategies to address those five core competencies. Some of the strategies that they've been learning about include identifying emotions and daily check-in sheets, sensory calming strategies, art and drawing, ways to encourage positive self-talk, ways to encourage positive relationships, incorporating SEL into their story time, and ideas for giving responsibility within the classroom. And now Matt, Madeline will discuss how our schools are gonna use the Terrace Matrix data. So as Rich had shared earlier this evening and based on the results from the Terrace Metrics data, each school has selected target areas to focus on and develop different ways on what to do for our next steps in Marion County Public Schools. So elementary, 
Uh, their target areas were hope, positive school experiences, and global satisfaction. And they're going to start by doing weekly newsletters, guidance lessons, building relationships with check-ins. And Marion County Middle School focused on leadership and grit, which they're going to start implementing and educating students on growth, mindset, and characteristics, and also leadership opportunities. Marion County Night Academy focused on leadership and hope, and they're going to utilize their guidance counselors and family resource to target small groups and bring back sources of strength. Marion County High School focused on anxiety and depression and also leadership. They're wanting to start a mental health week and they also want to start checking in with students with the counselors more often. And Marvel and Husey Spalding Academy, they also focus on anxiety, depression, and global satisfaction. And their next step would be to, um, an SEL Google Classroom with group uh, lessons and potential for weekly live meetings and check in with students and having mentors. And also, um, sorry about this, and the terrorist metrics reports will be going home this month with students um, with their report cards. And the SEL core team will also be working with Rich to offer parent workshops for parents in February. Okay. I'm Mariah Nicholas and I'm the elementary social emotional wellness educator. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our curriculum and our elementary spotlight. So as you as Jill had mentioned previously, Marion County Public Schools has adopted an SEL curriculum for preschool through 12th grade. We have Harmony for preschool through fifth and Habitudes for six through 12. Um, through both, throughout both curriculums, they have weekly lessons and activities that are very flexible and can be um, either 20 to 50 minutes based on um, the teachers or the school schedule that day. We have developed a district pacing guide with um, lessons one week and activities one week along with supplemental lessons and activities for both. Schools have also developed pacing guides that um, better meet their specific school needs. For Harmony, we have Meet Up and Buddy Up. So Meet Up is classroom meetings and lives. Those promote that positive school climate, um, leave time for questions and um, check-ins. And then for the Buddy Up, those are partner activities or small group activities that build relationships, community, and build that social awareness piece. Um, for Habitudes, Marion County Middle and the Knight Academy, so sixth through ninth grade, are focusing on character building and leadership. And at the high school, they focus on the SEL courses that align with our five SEL castle competencies. Um, a lot of their lessons are class-wide small group discussions. They focus a lot on images, self-assessment worksheets, as well as videos to help teach their lessons. Now um, that we have heard about our district SEL initiatives, we want to take just a second to talk about our elementary spotlight and highlight some of the specific things that each school is doing for SEL. So on the screen, you will see um, some of the things that are throughout all of our elementary schools. They have Sanford Harmony goals each week and for each unit. They have different forms of online mood check-ins. Um, they all are doing Sanford Harmony, preschool through fifth grade. And then um, in the top, you'll see a classroom job chart. So something as simple as this promotes that responsibility, um, builds community and that sense of belonging. So next we'll go into Glasscock Elementary. So they are doing a ton of things. You'll see some of the pictures there. They have a monthly SEL bulletin board daily mental health check-ins. They do a lot of staff self-care challenges. They have goal setting and vision boards, gratitude journaling, coping skills, um, a coping skill challenge in their Google Classroom. Their family resource does a lot with um, care kits and handing out coping sensory items. Um, when we're in school, they have an after-school program with SEL activities and they also do a lot with bullying prevention. So you can see some of those pictures there that are throughout their building. On our next slide, we have West Marion Elementary. So they do a lot of staff and student shout outs, the student page of the month, staff page of the month. They have a power page of the week award um, for a student that has set a good example or been kind. 
And they also do daily SEL check-ins. So you can see some of the pictures of those awards as well as um, their mood check-in that their students can do daily. Uh, for Calvary Elementary, they have an SEL section in Terrell's Tidbits, which is their um, email newsletter that they get weekly. They have a guidance counselor check-ins. They do online mood check-ins. They have houses and they also have mentors for the students. So you can see through some of these pictures, some of their bulletin boards throughout their hallway that are motivational or SEL, um, relationship building, some of their student mentors and their teamwork. And for Lennon Elementary, they have counseling tidbits in their staff newsletter. They have self-care for teachers in their newsletter, as well as a lot of staff activities. Um, weekly SEL lessons, an SEL question on their faculty sign-in, and daily SEL virtual sign-in. So you can see an example of an SEL check-in that they do and um, some of their self-care techniques that their teachers use. So now we want to focus on what the secondary does. So some of their highlights are that they use Habitudes uh, for their SEL program and then Smile Club. Uh, you know, we can't smile with our mouth anymore. So we want to always focus and smile with our eyes. And then uh, Marion County Night Academy is doing a Knights Council and that shows leadership. And on the next slide, it has Marion County Middle School. And some of the things that they do there to promote social emotional wellness, that they have leader in me. Um, they also have different ways to show kindness um, wrote on their walls. Uh, they have student mentors. They also are um, developing a smile club. And the junior beta had a service project which did suitcases, duffel bag donations for foster children. And Marion County Night Academy, they also do sources of strength. They do staff check-in and student check-ins. Um, they had a teen leadership food drive and they also developed turkey grams, which lets the student write what they're thankful for. And for Marion County High School, uh, they have student of the month. They also have smile club where they um, develop things on the walls to take what you need for someone to smile and also outside in the community to help. And they also came up with something this year for calming strips. That's something that students can put on their computers or even on the back of their phones. Whenever they get anxiety or feeling very distressed, they can run across their fingers across that. And then for Night Academy or Marvel and um, QC Spalding, um, there's a social emotional group and it has weekly lessons and then also the opportunity for live meetings. Um, they have a mentor where students um, check, ha, are checked in with by their teachers. And also um, they have a ray of sunshine art display for positive quotes, positive people in their life and what makes them smile. And that's all for that. And then this concludes our presentation for this evening. And again, thank you for your support. And are there any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you ladies, good presentation. We appreciate all the work you guys are putting in and we'll look forward to some more progress reports later down the road. And I, I just wanna say that um, our work is not just known here in our district. I was contacted yesterday by a teacher in another district who is a part of career and technical education. And they have asked Marion County to lead a session this summer for their summer conference. And so you see all these post-it notes across the back of the wall. Uh, that's kind of our journey that we've been through. And what I love about uh, this group and our principals and our staff, we've not just talked about all these academic health and, and uh, physical health and um, a student's mental health, we are actually working on getting better at that. And I, I love the survey because it identifies not just individual things that maybe an individual child needs, but it also tells us in a school and in a district, what are some things that we can work on? Uh, because like he said, 
when we identify that 50% of a student's success has something to do with behavioral health, that's something that can't be ignored. And so, you know, I just think uh, we're, we're doing some fantastic work. We haven't arrived, but um, these uh, leaders in our district are definitely making a difference and, and appreciate you all for, uh, you know, allowing us to use this terrorist metrics and we're gonna get better with that. And, um, and I'm just really pleased with, with, with the progress that we're making and, and it'll get better every day. Okay, thank you. All right, next on the agenda is District Wellness and Food Service Report. I think that'd be Ms. Willard. She muted. I think I'm unmuted now. Can y'all, everybody see me and hear me? And, and Leanna's got my slide presentation up. Um, Welcome, glad you're here. Glad that everybody can be here in person. Um, like it says down here at the bottom, this is a year like no other. So we have really worked hard in food service and as a district overall to, to do the very best we can for our children. Leanna, if you want to flip. Um, Rather than our normal district health and wellness report, I'm going to kind of go over some of our successes of the last 12 months because it has been such a different year. Um, part of the statute that says we have to do this does say that we have to monitor our school nutrition finances, how we feed our children, school nutrition in general. It also says we have to monitor things like social emotional wellness. So I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that tonight because that was just covered. Um, but looking at our successes over the last 12 months, we will cover these changing our meal policy, um, feeding our children through a pandemic, utilizing that Meals to You program, and then our continuation of being in the Kentucky Proud program. So, those of you who were here last year should remember our meal charge policy. At one point, Leanna, flip please. At one point, our meal charge policy had in there, and it's kind of a state written policy and a, a blanket one said that children who had more than five charges would be given an alter, alternate meal. Now we, that it was on paper, but we weren't enforcing it. We were not giving our children alternate meals. So before anybody gets all upset, we just, our cafeteria ladies would pay for those meals themselves before they would give kids a cheese sandwich and an apple. Um, so our new meal charge policy, the wording has changed on that. It's, it's removed completely the alternate meal. The only thing, the only penalty for having charges is they're not gonna be allowed to get all the carts if they've got charges. Um, that encourages some of those kids who have had charges for years to get those taken care of if they want to buy those extra things. But now as far as getting plenty to eat, our kids, if they take what's available for them off the lines, they are not leaving our cafeterias hungry. They're not leaving our cafeteria lines needing an a la carte. Um, so don't be concerned that they're not getting enough to eat because our ladies are gonna make sure they have plenty to eat. Those a la cartes are things like extra cookies, um, Rice Krispie treats, fruit snacks, at the high school level, they can get soft drinks, um, teas and lemonades, bottled waters and those sorts of things, but they have ample food there without those. And really and truly at this point, we've been CEP in this district long enough that the only children we have with charges left are our juniors and seniors at the high school. Um, we go down below that most of our children don't have any charges at all. So we've got a few lingering that have some that built up in elementary before we ever went CEP. But otherwise we don't have that issue at all now. Going on Leanna, um, our next thing, you know, as you all, all know, and Ms. Slosher tells you every month that our numbers of how many people we've served. So this is just a quick graph of March through December of what we've served. Now March, and that starts on March, we shut down on March 13th on that Friday. So that starts that next week. Um, so March's numbers weren't huge, but then you see how they've climbed. 
Um, we didn't serve in June, July, and and most of August, and I'll get into that in on the next slide. Um, but then if you look and you can pretty much tell when things got really bad, when the governor shut down things, our numbers went up. So, and we saw it every week. If he, if he got on the TV and said things were shutting down, that next week the numbers would, would go up. So we plan for that accordingly. We've gotten real good at planning our numbers and having a little extra and, and never running out. Um, we might run out at a school but we never run out of food in this district. There is plenty of meals sitting here. We have served, you know, breakfast, lunch, and a lot of people don't realize they're getting snacks in those bags too, most of the time. So that blue line is a snack line. We didn't do it in March. We didn't do it in September and we didn't do it in October because that's a different USDA program. And we had to wait for the waivers to become available on those to be able to give snacks. But we have done it in the months that we could. All right, so I said we didn't serve in July, June, July, and August. We participated, and some of you all that have children, you may have participated in it. We participated in that Meals to You program through Baylor University. There were 347 schools across the country that participated. Um, this was a great program, and the fact that it provided our families needed meals, but it allowed our staff who had worked really hard in that March, April, and May time period to still have some time off to recruit, recoup and, and get a little rest and relaxation. That next slide, Leanna, shows, just kind of shows some demographic numbers of what we got out of that Baylor program. So families received boxes every other week. Those boxes had 10 breakfast and 10 lunches, all completely shelf stable. Now, if you got it, you know that the milk was even shelf stable. Um, some people said they drank it. I wouldn't have drank it, but um, some people did say they drank it. It was perfectly fine to cook with. I cooked with a lot of it, but so <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> what are they saying in there? They're, they're still drinking it, Jennifer. They're still drinking it. <laughs> they're still drinking. Some of them are, but yeah. I mean, you just look at the number of boxes that came into this community. I know our UPS people got to work out on those, on those days and those weeks. Um, it was kind of a running joke for a while when I'd see some of the UPS guys, they, they knew what we were doing pretty quickly. And, and we had lots of boxes. If you see, we, we took care of 1171 households through that. You know, that's not all of our children by any means, but parents had the opportunity to sign up and, and we worked with families to help them get signed up for that. Um, we have maintained Kentucky proud status through every bit of this. We, um, and we have used local produce when we can. Of course, we're Central Kentucky right now. I'm not getting much local. It's just not available. Um, but, you know, our biggies, watermelons from Peterson's, I think everybody is aware that when we came back to school that last week of August and we did our first big serving, we sent a watermelon home with every child. Now, if you came through that line and you had five children, you got five watermelons. Um, <laughs> We have worked a lot with Lee's Greenhouse out of Hodgenville. They had a huge crop of corn. She and I happened to be talking one day and she said, I've got all this corn. I planned for a much another school district, a much larger school district. They, they had a contract, but they didn't hold them to it because they couldn't use it because they didn't go back to school. I said, well, we'll figure out how to use it if you can get it froze for me. And she said, oh yeah, I've got a flash freezer. We can freeze it. She said, I even individually wrap it. So lots of weeks when we've sent home bags, there's been an ear of corn in that bag. Um, and when we were in school, we've served corn on the cob to our kids and, and our kids really enjoyed that corn on the cob. Um, so we did that. And then you see, we've got, we gave out butternut squash muffins one time. We didn't tell the kids they were butternut squash. They were labeled as harvest, mu local harvest muffins, but that was a butternut squash product. Um, <laughs> kids wouldn't have ate it if we'd said butternut squash. And then we have gotten apples and pears from Hittons out of Hodgenville. Um, I'm continually looking for farmers that can give us the quantities of things we need, the quantities of the things that we need. And if you all know of anyone here in Marion County that's got things that we can use, by all means, send them my way. 
we would love to work with more people than just these, but these are the ones that are getting me the quantities and will deliver to us. Um, because of our work with Kentucky Proud and all the feeding we've done over the last nine months, um, we, I have been invited to participate in the Local Food Network monthly meeting. So I've been participating in that um, since September. And that's just, it's a monthly call. There's lots of different groups on that call. Lots of great information. Um, our district was featured as a KDE Spotlight sponsor. I have also been asked, and I didn't get it typed in here. I just actually thought about it sitting here. I have been asked to speak at two different conferences. Unfortunately, both of those have been canceled or postponed or gone remote. Um, so I'm already slated for probably to speak at those next year. Um, but that's a, a result partially of Kentucky Proud and partially of the numbers that we have shown in feeding. Um, and I don't know how much will be covered in the audit report, but I can tell you all, I am on calls almost weekly with food service directors from different places. Um, I've got one tomorrow that's going to have 30 or 40 people in it, but lots of school districts are talking about how much money their food service is losing through this pandemic. We have worked really hard and we are, we are not, we're not worried about whether we're going to be able to maintain our equipment. Um, you know, things break, things go down. I had a freezer going down yesterday afternoon and was dealing with freezer repair guy until 11 o'clock last night. So you got to have money to do those things. And there are lots of districts right now panicking that they're not going to continue to have money to do those things, but we are not one of those districts. And then just, you know, a little more of some money that's come into us. Um, we did, I got a call late in the spring that we received the USDA equipment grant to place a new standalone walk-in freezer out at Marion Middle. That building, um, when they all the renovations were done and when we went to the whole new world, the freezer capacity was not enough for 500 people. So we were having to get two trucks in a week out there. Um, this new freezer eliminated that need. So GFS was very thankful. So we got a grant. I think that freezer, ultimately the project ended up costing us a couple hundred dollars, but that grant was for $25,000. We got a grant from the Dairy Alliance through the Field Plus 60 grant to get milk dispensers, just like your, your Coke machine dispensers in restaurants, milk dispensers for West Marion. And the reason you do that is the milk comes out of those much colder. It's much fresher than what it is in those little cartons. Um, you know, if you drink out of those cartons, a lot of times you'll, you'll get a carton taste. If it's been, you know, they're still in date, but they're getting close. You'll have a kind of a cardboardy taste. This eliminates every bit of that. Now, I know that at one point when this, you know, this fall, somebody said, well, are we going to be able to use those during, during the pandemic? And Miss Anna and Mr. Mattingly and I, have already discussed, we are not gonna open those suckers up and we're not gonna start running them until the health department tells me that's safe. Um, but we did get cups and lids and everything to go with those. So that's something I hope our children will be very excited about when they see that roll out. Um, and then I talked about the Kentucky Proud. We also, and this is a grant I get every year, but the KVIP grant, it offsets the cost of locally bought produce. I actually get 50% back on any local produce through that KVIP grant. So when you look at that KVIP grant and the 50% back, that cuts our local produce for me down cheaper than what I can buy from GFS or a major produce distributor. And that's all I have, unless you all got questions. Any questions? Kudos. Awesome job, you guys. All the food service across the district, it's, it's incredible. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You're incredible. Oh, you just ah. heard your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Taylor, for your leadership and, and the, our lunchroom staff, as well as those folks that pitched in in March and continue to pitch in as we, we give out our meals and um, 
and we're very thankful that you've got the foresight to go after these grants and uh, get extra revenue in our district and give us some different opportunities. And it's pretty awesome that there's folks calling you and asking you to present. And I appreciate you be, being willing to collaborate uh, because we're not just making an impact on kids in Marion County, we're making an uh, impact uh, across the state of Kentucky. So that's, that's awesome, thank you. And, and make sure you let your staff know that uh, you, you presented and, and that the board as a whole is very pleased with, with all of the work. And uh, we know that this hasn't been easy, but we appreciate it and, and you're making a big difference. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Do y'all want to take a break? Well, I was, uh, I thought we might let Miss Abel, but since she's been here for a while, we get through that. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? So, you want to guess it? You want to skip the financial report, come back to that? Sure. All right. So, we'll go to 3G, fiscal year 2020 audit report. Leanne, do you have that, that segment? Pull up. To the, the board, I just want to say that um, we are thankful as a firm to, to be able to be here um, and to um, have conducted this audit. Um, COVID was um, a different animal for everything and it, it made auditing a different uh different as well um from everything down to coordinating when it was okay to be in a district when it wasn't okay to be in a district when people were under quarantine could you go could you not go how much can we do remotely all those kinds of things um to additional federal funds through the cares act um, and that had a significant impact across the state um, and actually led to essentially a statewide extension for school district audits if districts had expended any, any of those CARES Act funds um, because there were some questions about what those requirements were from an audit perspective to, to be able to report on. So uh, just lots of, of new things, lots of learning along the way. Um, and so uh, audit was a little bit slower getting, getting finished than, than we typically like. Um, but you know, COVID was most of the reason for impact that. It is not uncommon for me to present at a January board meeting because a lot of times the December one gets too full and gets too caught up with the holidays and whatnot. So I'm actually here about the same time I normally would be. So with that, um, we'll start with the independent auditor's report. Um, what Leanna is presenting on the screen for those folks is, is gonna be a selection of pages of the complete report. Um, the entire report is actually a hundred sheets of paper. Um, and so we didn't want to go through each hundred, <laughs> all hundred pages. So she's got a short segment that uh, I'll uh, help her scroll through as far as with some, with some cues and stuff as we go through. So the independent auditor's, auditor's report is an unmodified opinion. That is the opinion that you want. That means that is a clean opinion. Um, and so there's no, um, um, findings or scat departures or anything of that nature in this, uh, in this opinion. <coughs> All right. And Leanna, you're going to get to scroll probably about four pages there. Um, she does not have, but I do want to mention just because it is for the board members, a good reference tool. Um, pages four through 11 of the entire PDF or in your paper copy is management's discussion and analysis. Okay. And that is prepared um, by Mr. Spalding. And then we check that, but it is a, a shorter synopsis and summary of the financial information. It is a little bit easier to look at. So if you, if you need a quick summary or what she say or what that mean, I would have you look at, at those few pages first and then, and then just because it, sometimes they are really helpful. Okay, all right. What I'm going to skip past that is on page, um, it's page 12 of the report, and Leanne has got that up there. It's the statement of net position. You're on, you're on the right one, that's a good one. Um, and so I'm looking at total current assets, 
Um, $13.5 million for the district as of June 30th, uh, 2020. Okay. That's up about two and a half million from the year before. Um, and most of that increase is a cash increase as far as June 30th, 2020 compared to June 30th, 2019. Okay. You come down the page a little bit and the non-current assets that your buildings and your infrastructure and all your equipment net of accumulated depreciation of $26.6 million. Okay. Uh, that's down about 1.1 million from the year before because of depreciation, meaning that your depreciation was more than the assets that you purchased last year. So that caused that decrease. Okay. In a year that you don't have a significant amount of additions, that's pretty normal to see a decrease there. Uh, and you come down total assets and deferred outflows of $44 million. Your current liabilities are at 2.4 million. That was up only about 100,000 from the year before, uh, which is, is a very moderate uh, increase. Total non-current liabilities, which is your debt, primarily your bonds, but it also includes this underfunded net pension liability and underfunded net OPEB liability. Um, and that was at 35.8 million, but it was down about 1.5 million from the year before. Okay, so that's a reduction in that in that debt load as I would refer to it. Um, and so again, you come down total liabilities and debt position of $44 million. Lynn, I'm gonna go to that next page. And this is the statement of activities. Um, Ms. Slosher talked about being in school district world and in school finance world, <laughs> things look a little different <laughs> because um, Mr. Cox, this probably doesn't look like too many financial or income statements that you've seen, but this is essentially your income statement <laughs> uh, laid out a little differently. Um, I will point you to a, a couple of numbers, total school district expenses. Uh, $39.2 million, okay? That's in that very, very first column there. And then total uh, revenue, um, or excuse me, those total expenses were down about 645,000 from the year before, okay? And then total revenue for the district, and this is, this, when I say district, I mean this, this is everything, okay? Um, this is food service, this is debt, this is all your debt, this is all, all facets of the district, okay? Um, total revenue was up about 640000 which gives you a change in net position or essentially what I would say is net income of $1.2 million. Now, um, that was extremely significant because last year, meaning when I say last year, the June 30, 2019 audit, that number was a loss of 74000 So that's a, a $1.3 million swing in profit for June 30, 2020. Okay. okay and I'm going to uh, flip. Yep, perfect. The next page I'll look at is the um, governmental funds balance sheet. I'm not going to spend much time here, but I like to give you at least the full sets of statements, um, even if I'm going to do a reduced um, reduced size for a presentation. This set of uh, balance this set of balance sheets, um, Mr. Spalding would be very familiar with because the balance sheets and AFRs that you would get in a monthly financial. This is the this is the set of statements that match those. Those don't have all your Long, your bonds outstanding. They show bond payments through your debt service fund, but they don't show you the total amount that you still owe on the bonds like these front statements do. So that's, a, that's one of the main differences and one of the, the easier ones to, to understand. Um, and so those, are, so those are there. We're gonna flip on to the next page because since we do have two sets of numbers, there are reconciliations in here. I'm not gonna go through these um, with you guys. But I do want you to know that it's it's very um, they are it's a very thought out process that makes sure that hey those balance sheets that start with the balance sheets and AFRs and units that they do align up and agree with what gets on the overall financials and that the the differences between those are a very set specific set of criteria so that you know that they really do match and, and coincide and go together okay. 
All right, Leanna, we're gonna go to the next one. And this is your statement of revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance. This is essentially straight off your AFRs. It's formatted a little bit differently, but that monthly financial report that you get, uh, this is, is that coming from that same set of, of reports, okay? One thing that I will point out is that the general fund for the year ended June 30, 2020, did show a, a decrease in fund balance of just shy of $700,000, okay? Which means that that's eating into the district's general fund contingency. Now, I know that that was known ahead of time that some of that was, was happening and it was being discussed in the finance report and being discussed at different things in budgeting. The only reason I say that to bring that to your attention is just to remember to caution you as a board that as you make those, those changes, that you don't want to continue to eat into that contingency year after year after year, or you find yourself, um, you know, in in not good financial position. But just because it happened one year doesn't, you know, is is not necessarily alarming. The district still has a very healthy contingency. Okay. Yeah, man, we're gonna. That next page that she's got up is essentially it's a reconciliation again of just the income statements because you've got two different types there. And this shows you all those components that, that how those two um, interrelate and the differences between those two. Okay. All right. I think Ms. Wheeler wanted to steal some of my thunder if y'all if <laughs> noticed just a little bit because she um, said, I don't know how much the audit report will focus on this, but um, school food service did have a tremendous year. Uh, for the year ended June 30th, 2020, um, had $878,000 in cash um, at the end of the year at June 30th, 2020, and um, very positive growth. We had to go ahead and flip to that next one. We'll just get right to the chase here. Her um, food service for the district operating expenses was up about 234000 but um, revenue primarily focusing here, I'm looking at the federal and state revenue that's in the middle of the page um, and donated commodities and whatnot, $3.3 million. That's up almost $800,000 from the year before. Okay. So you end up with a positive change in net position or profit here for food service of $340,000. Now, Usually, I am also adding in, hey, let's add back this pension change because that's out of somebody's control. I didn't do that because this is such a strong number without that. But it actually, from a, um, in, this, in the district's control, is even stronger than that. <coughs> because you don't have that extra pension and OPEB expense instead of um, hitting that from a tax perspective. Okay. Uh, page 21 of the report is a statement of fiduciary net position because you, you all do have the agency funds or the school activity funds. Okay, so they had about $190,000 of cash combined that's total for all the schools. And then you have a private purpose trust fund and you say, what is that? That is the scholarship fund. The uh, Cohen Creek Scholarship Fund is maintained and is able to award typically anywhere from four to 7,000, I think, of scholarships in a, in a year um, to students and stuff. And that's, um, um, this respondent's been, um, was working hard on getting things switched over and stuff when I was here in the uh, in the fall working on the audit of getting, getting all that paperwork and stuff done. And there takes a, uh, a lot of things to get all that switched over um, that I'm sure um, Mr. Cox can attest to. <laughs> all right, we're gonna flip past there. And Lynn, go ahead and come on down to that next one. Uh, go the other, yeah, come on down. You're fine. This, I'm skipping several pages here. Um, this is a summary of your long-term, um, long-term liabilities, long-term debt. I, I point this one out because you, you think, as you think about projects, as you think about capital projects, as you think about, Things that you're doing. 
uh, 35 in the report, sorry. Oh, she can't, you can't figure it. Let me let them get there for a second. Sure. Okay. Okay. There, you've got your long-term liabilities so though, and sometimes folks are looking at, well, how, mu how much, how much do we have in bonds outstanding? You know, what do we owe right now before we do anything? Um, as of June 30, 2020, this gives you a, a synopsis. It shows you where your Kisbit was, where your capital leases were, and also where that pension and OPEP liability were, um, just so you can see those and have that in, in good summary. It has your free sick leave. Um, broke it out and so a lot of times I just point this out because it can be a useful tool when you're looking, especially when you're looking at capital projects. Okay. Leanna, go ahead and go to that next page. And this is a summary of your, your fixed assets. Again, that's your, your cap and your buildings and your equipment. Um, one thing here, um, Mary Middle was had, had some construction going on that had already started before June 30th, 2020. I uh, know that has continued now, but um, as of June 30th, you had spent about 431,000 on that project. So that was sitting in construction and progress at the, as of the uh, audit date. Um, and then you, there were some buses and some other technology pieces and whatnot that it bought. So you had $813,000 of fixed asset additions in the year, um, into June 30th, 2020. Okay. So, um, so pretty significant amount of, of additions there. All right. And then, yep, go ahead and go to that next one. And for those of you, I should have said this earlier, that have your paper version, we're flipping all the way back to 79, which is a two-pager. And it's one of those that'll open, open up if you've got your physical report there. And this is your schedule of expenditure for federal awards. So this is by program, how much federal monies were expended for the year into June 30th, 2020. If you look at the very bottom of the page, uh, you will see that that was $5,453,970, which was up just shy of about 700,000 from the year before. Okay, uh, So significant uh, amount of uh, federal monies expended. Um, federal monies do include full food service food service also gets some state money, but most of your funding for food service is federal. Okay, and so those are also listed here, and you'll see that summer food program, a national school lunch and school breakfast and whatnot. Now, go ahead and go to the next one. This is a summary schedule of findings and question cost. Um, in the audit this year, we did have a finding and that was um, related to um, the special education cluster. There is a, a federal rule that is called um, supplement, not supplant. You'll hear those words if you work with federal monies. And it's, it's that the district has to maintain how much money it spent essentially from its general fund in an area from one year to the next um, in this instance, compared to specifically for special education uh, children. And so you have to spend at least as much general fund money one year as you did the next year. And then that gets measured at the end of the following year or in, dur during the following year, because you have to complete it the year. And so it um, came up that Katie, KDE does um, monitor this. There are reports now that they actually put together um, and so when we had asked for the latest maintenance fiscal effort, there was a um, deficiency there of about $78,000. Um, as of the last time Minister Spalding and I talked about it, a um, payback plan had not officially been implemented. He was expecting to hear from that uh, from KDE any, uh, any day. I can tell you that as soon as this was found, there were immediately steps um, taken by um, Ms. Copenhagen, the former finance officer, and then now Mr. Spalding as well, 
to remedy this and make sure that they were good for fiscal year 20 so that they wouldn't have a repeat of it compared to fiscal year 19. Um, they now are working with Ms. Sharp heavily too on how to, how do you, you know, how does KDE pull this information so that we can pull this information and make sure that we're um, close or exceeding those requirements um, and, and making sure that they're checking that as the budgets change and expenditures change during the year and different things happen. Um, and so just a, as an additional check to monitor that so that they don't have that going forward, okay? Anybody have any questions on that? The, um, yep, you can come on down. That actually has the, the detail of the founding and whatnot. I'll let you all read that. I'm not gonna read that to you. Leanne, go ahead and go one more for me. Um, couple of pages I'm going to do very quickly. There is a there are two additional opinions in the report. One is on internal control over government auditing standards. One is over um, internal control over compliance with uniform guidance. When you say that's your federal programs, your federal monies. These are the clean opinions, except for that they mentioned that finding. Because if you do have something that leads to a finding related to federal awards, then they get they get mentioned specifically in these. Okay, so point that out. The management letter is a management has our management comments, and that's on page eighty eight. Yeah. Come on, one one more, Leanne. I did I just did those together, so there we go. Perfect. Um, this is. These are um, less in severity, if you will. There's there's like three levels of, of findings uh, within an audit. There's material weaknesses and things that create question cost. There's significant deficiencies in, in question cost. And then there's management letter comments. Management letter comments are much at the lower, lower end. Those are things that Hey, we notice these things and we think these things are, are things that you guys could do a little bit better with. Um, the key here is kind of the uh, theme in those in these management letter comments is just to make sure that uh, purchase orders are being signed and approved properly and completely filled out prior to a disbursement being incurred. Um, but there wasn't anything that gave us alarm that something had been spent wrong. There wasn't anything that we thought was funny or anything like that. Most of it is a, hey, let's get get your paperwork in line so that it shows that you for sure had that approval in time. Okay. All right. Lenny, you come on down because I'll let them look at those on their own. I'm not going to try to read each one by any means. Yeah, and that's on page 91. Yeah, so the next one is, and this is a um, letter to you as the board of directors. Um, and with an audit, we are um, required to um, tell you certain things we're required. But one of the things is that if we had any problems with the audit, if we had any problems conducting the audit, getting information, couldn't um, trouble with um, getting questions answered or any of those things, we're required to let you know that. Um, and so this is a standard letter because one of the things that I love about coming here is I never have any of that. Even when we have something like that we had come up with, with this maintenance of fiscal effort, Ms. Sharp, Mr. Spalding worked. Um, they were very candid with me. They were telling me what all had transpired, how it came about what all the work was being done to remedy it. Um, and those things, uh, as an auditor, you just really appreciate. So um, great, great folks to work with, and I'm always appreciative of that. So, that's all I've got. Does anybody have any questions? I have a couple. Um, going back to, I don't know what page it's on. Where we showed where we had lost money this year. Oh, in the, the in, within the general fund, within yes. The general fund, yes. Which is on page 16. Okay. And this is a 
question to all of you guys as well. And you may not know the answer, it might be a stock question, but the year before, did we show a net loss as well, or did we show a, a, a gain? I, it was virtually at about, it was Pretty roughly hard. break even, I believe. Okay. Now, uh, and like I said, this may not be something you can answer, but is the loss this year, is that does that go to any one thing, or is this something, an accumulation of things, or is it something uh, you can point it was, to? It was basically by design. We, we had a really healthy contingency, and as a board, we made a decision that, you know, although we definitely want to be in great financial position and have a really strong rainy day fund, that our goal isn't to just continue to accumulate and pile up funds when we can be using those funds to administer services to students and provide things to students. So we made a, and you know, increase um, salaries for teachers and things like that. So we made a decision as a board that, you know, we were okay with slowly seeing that spin down just to, you know, just a little bit over a few years and sort of monitor year by year to, you know, to make sure that we don't get below a, a level that we're not comfortable with. Okay, so yeah, it was something that's planned and something mm -hmm. that was not, right. that, that just came up. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. And, and you may get this question, Mr. Lee, but remember this is as of June 30th. Last year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 2020, I guess. I'm, I'm <laughs> it's the 1920, yes. I'm so, 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 right. Yeah. So that I'm, yeah, good question. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So, yeah. Did you have any other questions? Uh, no. If I do, I'm sure that you guys have had to answer them later on. Absolutely. Stephanie does an outstanding job. We appreciate you being here. And uh, you're absolutely right. Whatever we need to do to, to support you. And I also want to say something about their firm. If we have a question outside of just auditing purposes, if we've got a question or something comes up, we know that we can pick up the phone, give them a call, and they're always so helpful with us with, with whatever we do. So we feel like they're not just an auditor, but they're a partner. And so when, when you're talking about this kind of budget and so many different sources of revenue and, you know, money coming in, money coming out, we, we feel like that they are, they're, they're who we want to work with. So we just want to say thank you and appreciate you coming tonight, especially under the circumstances. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and yes, if you, all have, if you all have a question, feel free to send it to Mr. Spalding. Feel free to email me directly. He's got my email and stuff. If you get looking at something and you're like, what did she say that means? Just by all means, feel free to just ask. Thank you, Ms. Abel. Thank you. All right, well, let's take about, what, 10 minutes, you think? That's kind of good. We'll take about a 10 minute break and we'll come back and reconvene. Thank you. That was great. Right. No, it's a great.
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started back. Peggy, are you with us? <laughs> Peggy, I just want to say, you know you've made it when you can just go by one name. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll move on. The next item is the finance report and filling in for Mr. Spalding is Ms. Slosser. All right, Leanna. All righty, here we go with our finance report. And so uh, remember that um, we are looking at November. I know it's January, but we're looking at uh, the month end of November. Also want to let the board know on a side note that uh, our former um, finance director, Ms. Copenhauer, is coming in some throughout the month and is uh, basically subbing, so to speak. And she's actually supporting Scott as he transitions into his new role. So that's nice to have her area of expertise on there. But just if you if you can, uh, just some things I'll go over similar to what Mr. Spalding would. And that is that our property tax is favorable. Obviously folks are paying their property tax. And what we found is that's actually been a lot more positive than than we thought our motor vehicle tax is up 129 percent uh, utility tax is a little bit down a little bit lower than normal um, our revenue in lieu of hasn't changed our interest is actually down it's unfavorable a bit if you'll remember uh, mr spaulding had talked about how the rate had actually decreased and i think that's just going to be across the board based on where we are um, our seek is actually unfavorable just to be at just 1%. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement is unfavorable, 56%. Uh, but as you can imagine, we are reimbursed based on visits. And because we're not in school, then that's, that's the reason that you're looking at that. And, um, you know, we do have a little bit of other that's unfavorable, but, but that's anything from property tax of what we see last year versus this year. It's just the way it comes in. Um, I know that we are looking at November and, and, and we're looking at uh, our financial report for this month, but we're always looking at what did we balance? What's our ending? And in, in the end, uh, the, the worst part, I don't want to say the worst part is you're always, you know, trying to catch up and what you're looking at today is not necessarily what we're operating on, but we are operating within our budget. As far as our expenses, when you look at with those things, it's actually favorable by a couple percent. Our student support services, it's also favorable. You can see 3%. And uh, some other things, uh, just slightly, just a 1% unfavorable, um, just because of coding. And when you see the word ECE, that's our exceptional children or special education. And, and that's because of coding. Uh, district support is just, uh, we had to correct some things. So that's actually a, a coding issue, similar to what the, uh, the auditor said, as we work through that, we just wanna make sure that that's accurate. So that's a little bit unfavorable. School support staff's actually up a bit, as well as finance, again, movement with some personnel things. Plant operation is actually favorable by 30%. As you can imagine, transportation is favorable just because we've not had buses on the road, savings with our fuel. Community services is actually favorable by 127%, but that's a positive because that's another grant opportunity that we've had. No change in our land improvement. Our debt services obviously is 25% up, but as you all can imagine, we've got a project going on down at the middle school, so that's gonna look a little bit different and um, our fund transfers are unchanged. So, um, you know, this is what we're looking at. And then you can see our account balance and, uh, you know, Mr. Spaulding has everything reconciled. You can see that um, our account balance uh, currently is 10.6. And then there are some, uh, a few things that are outstanding, but everything balanced out and our food service is in great shape a couple of years ago that we were really concerned about that. And uh, Ms. Wheeler and staff have done a great job on that. And let's see, 
our, our special revenues, obviously that's gonna be fun too. I'm not sure if I'm matching up with what's up here, but that's gonna be our federal programs that we have. And if you'll see, we actually bring in a lot of money uh, with those programs. Uh, that balance is about 435,000. I will let the board know that we did receive additional funding. It's not a part of this program but some additional stimulus money that we'll receive in our part is about $3.2 million. Uh, but that is, yeah, that's a, that's a lot. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't know what we're going to encounter over this next, and we don't have any idea what SEEK is going to look like in revenue at the state level. So we don't know if we're going to have to replace some of the money that we would normally get with this money or if it's going to be a way for us to help that general fund bottom line balance. And so uh, we'll, we'll get to work on that. We've not been given um, our funds yet from the GEARS money, which will actually come from the governor. I know I'm jumping around, but that's a positive, right? $3.2 million is a positive. Uh, that, that is calculated based on our Title I funds. And the, like we talked about in our work session, our Title I funding is based on the number of students who are economically challenged or at a disadvantage. And so, as you can see, we close out the month with uh, 17,466,715,16. Um, I just went over some of these uh, at the bottom here, these individual things. District activity account, remember that's going to be at the school level, but that's something that we do account for. <coughs> and then our capital outlay building fund construction debt services, even though there's several funds, a lot of that money flows in, flows out. Uh, none of our nickel tax has been spent. Just as a reminder, we're, we're still collecting that and that's in there uh, other than a small portion that we uh, are using overall just with that middle school project. Again, food service has got a healthy balance. And so when we end that, we've, we've got a good balance, but we're always looking, especially at that general fund, um, uh, knowing that we're down about $700,000 um, you know, we just want to think about not just where we're going to end in 2020, but where are we going to end over the next five years, over the next 10 years, that those operating expenses, um, you know, instruction is, uh, and, and those student support services are going to account for about 85% of our budget. And so uh, the stronger general fund balance we have, the stronger opportunities that we can provide for kids and uh, the grants that we receive, the donations that we receive, always just trying to find a way to, to use our money wisely and uh, continue to increase revenue in innovative kinds of ways. So, um, and I do wanna say that, um, like we said on Tuesday night, very uh, sorry for Mr. Spalding's loss. And uh, I, I'm thankful that we've been able to conduct our board meetings on Tuesday and today, because that's one less thing that he's going to have to worry about um, as, as he goes through his uh, next few weeks, if not months. So, do you have any questions? I'll do my best to answer. I only have one question. I know that, in, so we are looking at November, and I think the reason that we had shifted the schedule is because for last year, we met on the first Thursday of the month, so it made it challenging to close a month and report on it within that first week. So now that we're back to meeting on the second Thursday, do we anticipate shifting the reporting so that we are looking at the previous month again, or are we uh, planning to stay with well, it? It's, it's kind of a, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I thought the same thing when we looked at November since we are doing mm -hmm. uh, that second. Um, I've had that conversation with Mr. Spalding and Ms. Copeland there to find out if if there's a way that since we're doing that, we could get that and, and get the month closed up. It may be something that um, I ask the board if there's any way that we could finish this physical year at June and then maybe get caught up just as he's learning his new job. But when we report back in, in uh, February, we'll, we'll let you know either way. That's okay. Okay. Any other questions on the finance report? Okay. Moving on to item 3H, discussion of Senate Bill 101. So earlier in the um, fall, we talked about the Senate bill that Mr. Higdon had an opportunity to get passed, where the area 
technology center could be taken over by a local school district. And you all had asked that I bring back information. I know it's been a bit, um, but you know, seems like a lot of water keeps going under the bridge. So I did uh, reach out to Frankfurt this week and I talked to them about exactly what does that mean? You know, what will it mean if Marion County were to participate in that? And I talked with Dave Horseman. He is the Associate Commissioner of Career Technical Education. Um, I did, the bill is uploaded. It was actually a part of a house bill because it came in so late. So there's just some paragraphs in there for that. But it would include that we would be reimbursed for payroll, okay? Now, when you look at their payroll, you're going to see that that includes benefits. If we were to take over the uh, technology center and those folks were to become our employees, their insurance is paid for by the state. We couldn't double dip. In other words, they're not going to reimburse us for their insurance when the state's going to do that. So that would look just a little bit different. Uh, we would receive the money uh, for the building. We would receive um, whatever the state's given us for the, the uh, seat portion. There's a little bit of supplies that we would get reimbursed for. A question that came up the last time we talked about this was the interlocal agreement that we would need to work out with Washington County. As you all know, we serve that community. And um, I, the question was, I ask, is this something that we can do on our own or would you need this interlocal agreement prior to? You would need that prior to. I have reached out to the superintendent of Washington County just to let her know that we are talking about this tonight just as a discussion item. And that if the two of us could get together and talk about, you know, what could that look like or what that would look like. Obviously, the Department of Education would help us with that. Nelson County has taken over their area tech center as well as Greene County. So they have had some opportunities over this year to kind of work through some of those things. Another uh, thing to be aware of, and you probably saw this in the audit report, but when you look through all those federal programs, there's a program called Perkins. That's where we get some funding for our career and tech ed. We actually get that at Marion County High School as well as the ATC, but it's two separate forms of, of revenue. They, they get their Perkins, we get ours, so to speak, down here. What would happen is that would all come together, uh, Mr. Benny Field, so we would have one uh, budget for that, and then we would have to divide that out uh, currently. The first year we would receive 100% of the budget that is slated for that uh, technology center to include all these things I just discussed. However, the second year would only be 75%. Um, so that, that is something to keep in mind. And so the question would be, you know, is that something that we wanna take on? Uh, the positives to that, because I know when you hear 100% and 75%, that would be either a, if you keep all the programs, that's either going to be a general fund expense or maybe we could uh, work with some local business and industry that would say to us, these are specific programs that we want taught. And if that's the case, would they be willing to support the finances of that teacher or that program, okay? The nice part about this is we would have the opportunity to select the programs based on what our community needs, our business and industry needs. Um, if we were to continue in COVID, uh, like before, if you'll remember, we were going to school, but the Area Technology Center was not, which meant our kids at the ATC, both at Knight Academy and the high school were in the gym and we had to assign staff members to actually watch them as they worked on their computer or in different spaces or things like that. And it, it creates a, a strong partnership, uh, you know, within our business and industry, because as it changes, we can change those programs. Currently, the state dictates to us what our programs are. And if they decide there's not enough money for a program or they decide the enrollment's not what they want, they can actually cut that program. And, and that, that's what happened when we had an informational technology teacher there. 
um, someone retired. It wasn't that we didn't have the kiddos or the student enrollment. It was just that they said we don't have the budget for that, so that program was cut. So there's a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses, or there's pluses and minuses. I won't say a lot. It just depends on how you look at that. Uh, and this is my homemade, uh, you know, when you don't, this is, I guess, innovative, I hope you all think, but this is my notes that I was making. I was trying to write as he spoke. But I did go ahead and reach out to him and I asked him if his department would give us concrete numbers on what we're looking at. You know, it's it's one thing to say it's 100% and 75%, but what is that 100%? What is that 75%? I do want to remind the board, uh, Mr. Lee, especially just to remind you is that currently the principal is actually our employee and we have an agreement with the Department of Education. And so they reimburse us so much of her salary and we pick up the rest. She, she is a Marion County employee. Typically in the past, that's not been the way that's operated. They are an employee of the state. This way, um, myself and the superintendent of Washington County, we do the evaluation, set the ex expectation, things like that. Our board also pays for a guidance counselor at the ATC. It's not required. It's just something that we believe is really important. If you're going to have a group of kids and that's their area, we want to make sure that we are advising them you know, accordingly. And then the building is ours and we renovated that. I'm going to say it's probably been 10 plus years since that's happened, but it's our building. We did the renovation and we also have two pre-engineering teachers that's assigned to that building. And we also have uh, a math and an English teacher that are there that we're paying for. So we're already doing some really innovative uh, programs at the ATC. It's just a matter of is this something we want to do completely or do we want to continue? Um, and right now it is written into the, the language and the budget. And if we don't take advantage of it this year, it may be uh, the window may close, you know, the door may close and we may not be able to. So I think it's important that we explore it. And, and then the board can make a decision about what that looks like. And I will get that information and have that to you uh, no later than the next board meeting. And hopefully we'll have had an opportunity to speak with superintendent in Washington County. So my question to you all is, is there information that you want me to get on top of what I've already talked about? Maybe we can reach out. I have a question. Okay. Uh, on on the second year when it goes to 75%, is that 75% from there for so many years or is it just the second year and then we're on our own or what? what is that? From what I understand, Peggy, it is from this point forward. They're not, it's not just going to be a 100% and then 75% because, you know, there's no way. I mean, that's, you know, we, we, we can't take on that kind of responsibility. I, I wouldn't recommend that. I just wanted to check, double check that. Yeah. Part of this question. So it would be 75% every year after that? Yes. That makes a big difference. Oh, yes. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. I was going to say maybe we could reach out to Nelson and Green, see what their experience has been like as well. You know, they've got pros and cons or hurdles they've had to overcome or things that they didn't realize that they may be a good resource to reach out to. Okay. And also, uh, if, if there is a for sure concrete, you need, need to be done by this point. Uh, you know, is it something that's going to be around just this fiscal year? Or is it in the next two years, is it something? You know, uh, Mr. Horseman said, if we wanted to pursue this, we needed to have this in place and everything squared away by June 3rd. But I will ask, is it even an option afterwards that if we want to, that, that was his, so I was taking it that it's, we've got these six, six months. months. We've got six months. No, no. Sure, you don't know this offhand, but how many area technologies are there in the state and how many are taking them up on top? 
I know that, for example, uh, what is the county beside Jefferson County? Bullock County. Bullock County has, has their own ATC. Mason County, I mean, I'm just, it's probably the people I just know, but I, I can, uh, I can find that out. Not every school district has an ATC, just like Washington County, Taylor County, and Campbellsville don't. A lot of times they have to share. So I'm not sure how many there are, and I would have to ask how many. Now, one thing that some of these folks are really upset about is the fact that when they took over their local control, they didn't get this option. They just said, I'm taking over. I don't like the way this is going. And so they're not getting any state funding. So I, you know, but they're, you're looking at a little bit different school system and a little bit different sources of revenue in, in their world. Uh, one more thing to Laura. Uh -huh. Did they not build some sort of technology center in Washington County? They uh, did not build a technology center. They renovated a space and they are using that similar to what we are doing. They don't have as many programs, but we are fortunate. We, we've been trying to share and go back and forth. Under normal circumstances, we would, um, but they're not receiving any funding for that building. That's just something that Washington County did on their own. Thank you. Good question. Ms. Foster also, by taking over, we would, we could potentially have the freedom to kind of create our own curriculum up there, you know, find classes that are new and in it. Like we can yes. maybe have a lot of liberties and really do some more innovative things up there. Absolutely. That's, one, that's been one of the things that the school system, the ATC and business and industry that, that's been tough because there are certain things that you have to do. They tell us you have to do. The business and industry are telling us we want you to do this and we're bound. And that's you know, that's a struggle. Like you, you know, we're living in school world. You're you're out there in, in, in the you know business and industry and, and manufacturing world and you know what kids need when they leave to go on the floor, but maybe it's not in that curriculum. So yes that does give us some flexibility. We can decide, you know, there's certain things we want kids to know and be able to do in, in first grade and kindergarten, but there's also some things, maybe our portrait of a graduate, that grit, that whole, some of those things that we get to add in there, uh, some autonomy, and, and that's something that we've definitely struggled with in our community for several years. Yeah, I mean, I think that this could potentially give us an opportunity to really build some really strong relationships with industry. And fortunately for us, you know, we have a lot of industry in the area. And I think that maybe uh, Christina and her team or whomever uh, could, you know, I think it would be beneficial if they maybe did a little bit of a road show or something and go meet with these different industries and. And, and share, you know, what the possibilities are of having our own control and being able to partner with them and kind of see what their appetite is for, because I think that may be a small gap to cover based on the amount, you know, we may really get good feedback and potentially a lot of participation and funding from local business and, and really be something positive that can, you know, really change that. And, and, you know, when they talk about this supply budget, it, it's never a lot. Um, Christina will tell you that, our principal will tell you that all the time, and we are very fortunate that folks will donate, you know, the, the, the welding curtains, or they'll donate the tools, or they'll donate some of those, you know, here's some scrap, you know, we're, we're not using this piece of metal, and, and we can do that for you. I mean, that's what make that, that's, that's going to make those programs, you know, special. And that's what's going to get kids out in that business and industry world. And ultimately, I mean, you got 35 plus business and industry, you know, that's, you know, our kids have an opportunity to have a fantastic career and stay home if that's what they choose to do. And or if they choose to go to Japan and, and, and do something in a business and industry there, we just want them to be prepared. And, um, you know, if this window is between now and June the 30th, 
um, you know, I, I want to make sure that I give you all all the information so we can make a good decision. And like Peggy talked about, when uh, Washington County's got some programs over there, they've got an aeronautics program and they have a computer science program. So those are two programs that we do not have, but just think about maybe even a stronger partnership that we could have with Washington County. If, if you know, I know that one of the things that Nelson County has done is just because the nursing program is at the ATC, they they actually have a nurse in one of the schools, so the kids don't even have to travel. Because you know, if you're at Thomas Nelson, you have to you know travel. So there could be some cool things that we could do to uh, just continue to like like we all talk about how we're going to increase access and opportunities so our kids can be you know ready. So. Well, I think as you mentioned, you know, it'd be good to get some good hard numbers. It'd be good to see what Washington County's uh, feeling is on this. And we have a little more information. You got my neck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions on Senate Bill 101? Okay, we'll move on to item five. Item five. And need a motion for, or excuse me, for a motion for 4A. I make a motion to consider approval of the 2021 bus discipline matrix. I second that. Okay, any discussion or questions? Um, yeah, I have a somewhat question. Um, According to uh, Mr. Anyone, well, I guess one of the main reasons for, for this was uh, because the you could not no longer use a sign seating for disciplinary action. And my question is, is after COVID or whenever things get back to normal, whatever normal is, will will they be re-looking at this maybe to go back to that? that that's an excellent question. Yes, because I'm going to say yes because of COVID that everyone has a signed seat. But then I'm going to say we were all we were always supposed to be in signed seats, and so he actually met with the principals, and we also brought in Mr. Mills, who's a part of our um, you know Department of Transportation, who kind of represented the bus drivers because he helps drive buses some as well. And so we really kind of had uh, some concerns from both the principals and from our bus drivers that that really, an assigned seat really wasn't working out that well. And, you know, and then when it doesn't work out, it's brought to the principals. So they feel like that a better way to approach this is we've got our assigned seats. If there's a problem, that first line of defense is that bus driver is gonna have a conversation with the principal to talk about all the things the bus driver did to try to correct that behavior. So uh, unless something changes, I'm gonna say that this is gonna stay the same. We're always gonna look at it, always gonna try to find ways to get kids to and from school safely. Um, you can imagine driving a bus with anywhere between, um, you know, 10 or fewer, fewer kids on a special needs bus or, or 70, just trying to keep, keep everyone safe. So I'm gonna say it's gonna stay the same, Ms. Shirley. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Ayes have it. Need a motion for 4B. I make a motion consider approval of pay application number 11 to OMNI Commercial LLC in the amount of $50,557.62 for work performed on the Marion County Middle School addition and renovation project, BG number 19-363. I'll second. Any questions or comments? I had an opportunity. I, oh, I just wanted to let you all know I did have an opportunity over the Christmas break uh, to walk through the addition and remember, we do have a new science classroom and two other classrooms and uh, the blending on the outside and on the inside is, is very nice. Uh, the technology looks good. The color schemes uh, looking good. So 
Um, we, we've ordered new furniture for those four rooms. Our science classrooms will be equipped with the appropriate kind of science uh, tables that are needed. And uh, they've been great to work with. And another thing I, I think the board will be pleased with is they use several local contractors for some of the work. So, you know, I, I think that that's a positive for this company as well. Peggy, I'm sorry. You had a no, question? Uh, or no, just a comment. I thought it really looked good on the outside. I've never been in, but the outside really looked good. Yeah, I was there today because uh, we got something from the school and the, like you said, the blending on the outside is incredible because, you know, there's, I, I feel like it's kind of unique brick color out there. And so the fact that they did just a great job in matching it so that, you know, once the grass grows in and, and all of that stuff, you really will not be able to tell that it's an addition out there. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. Need a motion for 4C. I'll have a motion to consider approval of the change order number three to on the construction LLC for a credit of $2,460 for changes in the exterior stair handrails to reuse existing handrails in lieu of replacing the new handrails for a credit to the project. Second. Any comments, questions? We like credits. We like credits are good, <laughs> credits are good. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Need a motion for 4D. Consideration approval of change order number four to on the commercial for a credit of $15,720. LLC for the return of unused allowance amounts on the project for a credit to the project. Any comments or questions? We have about 30,000 more credit. We wipe out 4B. <laughs> so all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Need a motion for 4E. Motion to consider approval for revised 2021 re-entry plan. I second. Okay. Comments or questions? Uh, could, you, could you explain that some to Laura? Yes. Uh, if you remember back in the fall when we were trying to get back in school, uh, we had a, um, a re entry plan that we worked through, and we had a, a three tier system. Um, we were asked not to go back to school, but in the event that we wanted to go back, we would make an appointment with the commissioner, talk to Dr. Wyatt. And we did all those kinds of things. It kind of gave an outline of what we were gonna do to try to get back into school. We did go back earlier than the governor recommended. Uh, we were able to stay in school uh, through, um, I think our last day was Oct around October the 22nd. And so from October the 26th on, we've been operating under this executive order after Christmas break. Uh, the governor gave us the go ahead uh, based on some guidance we received from KDE. I think the date was December the 14th, I guess, you know, thereabout. And it talked about that in the event that a school district wanted to go back to school, it gave us some um, modes of instruction. Well, it, it really doesn't give specifics on what that mode of instruction would look like, but it does talk about an aggressive hybrid. Well, as you can imagine, uh, superintendents and administrators across the state have been talking about like, what does that look like? What it looks like in one district may not look the same way in another district. And so even some folks uh, believe that when we went back to school in the fall, and 80 to 90 percent of our kids were in class and 10 percent of those or 20 percent were home doing distance learning that could be considered hybrid well obviously um you know the, the thing that that we are hearing from health officials is that they want us to reduce the number of people in a facility and so you know 
Um, what I would like to be able to do based on numbers, obviously we're looking at our incident rate and I wrote down based on uh, what, what Tim helped me with today, he's fantastic. Our average incident rate over the past seven days has been 76. When we were in school, it was closer to that 40, but remember that was, we, we were up to almost 90% of our kids were coming back. And let's just face it, one of the things we talk about is not only wearing a mask, but being six feet apart. Now, if you've got 90% of your kids back, it's gonna be hard to do the six feet. And we had some folks that were uncomfortable with that. Um, and when you look at that 76, that doesn't mean we have 76 new cases, it's 76, uh, which is, it's the number of cases per 100,000. So you're looking at about, on average, about 15 new cases a day. That's what that actually looks like. Then you're also looking at our positivity rate in the district. And then a big thing that we look at is how many staff are affected by COVID. And affected could mean that either they have COVID or they are quarantined because they've been exposed or maybe they have a child that's been exposed and they are actually the primary caregiver. And so today uh, we had uh, 36 staff that were quarantined. Now that was this morning at 11 o'clock. Since then, I'm sure we've had, well, we've had four more, so we're up to 40, okay? And so, uh, and of those 40, only 26 of those folks are going to be back on the 19th of January. Oh, wow. And so, um, you know, I'm sorry, only 15 will return. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I'm looking at too many numbers here. I had to write them down to make sure I got it right, but only 15 will return out of 40. And so, you know, um, one of the things that myself and the administrators are charged with is to make sure that a school is safe and that staff are safe. And it's, it's we're, we're dealing with a global pandemic uh, but, but I think about this the same way we do when we get up at four o'clock in the morning and check roads. Is it safe to go to school? And, you know, if you, you, you don't have a safe environment, you can't go to school. And the other thing I think about is the fact that I'm thankful that our, our teachers are doing a fantastic job under these circumstances and we have wonderful support staff. So I can't say that enough. Uh, that goes right along with all the things that we talked about on our spotlight. Um, so what I would like to, Peggy, what, I, what I'm talking about is I would like to be able to add an option in that I can use this mode of um, different kind of instruction. Now, we have had opportunities where small groups of kids come in so you could even say that that is somewhat of an aggressive hybrid, but you will hear that there are folks that are doing a hybrid where a group of students come on certain days and another group come on another uh, uh, day or two. Uh, so I would like to be able to, to be able to get our, get our kids in the building with being able to space them out six feet apart, reduce the number of kids that are coming in, if we could actually look at a possible A group and a B group. Uh, and I know there's a lot of questions that go along with that, such as who's A, who's B. Uh, what other superintendents and school districts have done, they've utilized their infinite campus program and they look at households versus students because obviously, um, in some households, you could have a middle school, a high schooler, um, um, but you could also have blended families, uh, children living with grandparents and, and, and different things like that. Um, it, it would be great um, if we could get some of our kids in the building, but remembering that at every single step of the way, families this school year have an opportunity to do distance learning every single day, regardless of the mode of instruction that we're participating in, uh, that you know they can make that decision. Um, I, I'm going to announce tonight 
that next week will be another week of distance learning. We are just not at a point um, that, that I feel comfortable bringing uh, students back in. Um, in the event that um, we can change our reentry plan to where there's some more flexibility to make some decisions. And, and I want the board to know that I, that I don't ever take, make any of these decisions alone or by myself. Uh, you know, this morning it was Mr. Sampson, Mr. Benningfield and Mr. Lyons. And that was after having a conversation with the health department and after talking to the, you know, the superintendents around. Um, in the event that we did have the opportunity to do something different, um, I think it's important to communicate to parents uh, what group they would be assigned. Um, I think it's important to let them know they get to make that decision. Do you want to come back under these circumstances? It would be important to clarify all of these things. It's also important to support our staff as it would be something different that would give us time to work through that. And also for our students in grades six through 12, keep in mind that next Friday is the end of the semester. So if you've got students in grades six through 12, their classes will change. Now, we also need time for our uh, transportation staff to know who is group, what household is group A, what household is group B. If there's things that we've not thought about, we want, we want parents to be able to ask those questions and we want people to feel safe. And, you know, we want to be able to keep doing our food service. Um, obviously, if kids go to school two days a week, we're going to send home five days worth of meals. We're going to do that. Um, and in the event at any given time, if we don't feel like it's safe, we can always go back to a distance learning day or an NTI day. And um, also small groups um, is something that we can continue to do. And I wish that I could tell everybody what, what next, month, next Tuesday is going to look like as far as numbers. I wish I could tell them what January the 25th is going to be. But as you all know, every single day it changes. Um, this morning, you know, Mr. Ryan shared we have 36 staff quarantined for either way. And, and by the time we walk in here at four o'clock today, we have four additional cases. It's a global pandemic. And, you know, I know folks that have lost loved ones to COVID. And this is not something that is just unique to Marion County. And I'm, I'm optimistic about the vaccine and would just like to ask the board if, if, if it would be okay to change this reentry plan and, and have some flexibility. And uh, it's just an option. And just because we put this in here doesn't even mean that we're going to be able to, to utilize it. But it's just like our snow plan. You've got snow plan A, snow plan B, one hour to delay, two hour to delay, and, and, and things like that. So I know you all, I'm sure, have been bombarded with questions. And I do have Mr. Simpson on our Zoom call. He did work to revise this plan. Um, Mr. Lyons and his staff is working on being able to go ahead and get uh, households assigned to an A group or B group. And um, so I'm gonna stop talking because I know y'all have a lot of questions. And, uh, and I know that we're gonna have to answer some of these several times just to make sure that families uh, can make a decision that's best for them in their household. So, okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> can y'all drive that first? No. <laughs> uh, okay. I think that you get on that a little bit later, but who and how will determine if a household is A or B? We are going to use in the campus, which is which is our student information system and. Uh, I think if, if you'll recall in some board meetings when Mr. Ryan pulled up some things and the students had a student ID number, okay, that's basically how we and, and all of our students that live in the same household are tied together. So it's a pretty elaborate um, system that we use that actually reports our attendance, our grades, who's in a specific program. So uh, we, are, we are working with that and that's how they will be assigned. Okay, and a lot of the other questions you've already answered or you, you put in there, so I'll be able to answer them. And these are, these are 
questions from parents. Okay, good. That's, that's, that's what we need to hear. Yeah. We need to hear what questions will, parents have. Will parents get a choice to pick a group if, say, for some reason they need to, if they work on Monday, Tuesday, and would be better off sending their kids on Thursday, Friday? Would they have any ability to pick which group or uh, to ask to get revised? It would have to be an extreme circumstances because the last thing we want is once a household finds out that they're group A and their child finds out their best friend is in group B, they're going to want to change. And the one thing, the reason that we would do this is remember we want to reduce the class size. So let's say that 80% of our folks say they want to come back we got to try to keep it at that 40% and that 40% so that we can spread out using that six feet rule. Okay. Other questions? Uh, we think about considering if like putting out another survey to see what kind of response we would get of who would be coming back and who would be maintaining distance learning or or we just right now, well, well, that's that's a good question, and we talked about this morning. Do we do a survey? What we will do, um, if, if this is the case, is that we will actually need parents to let us know if you're not going to opt in in the event that we do the hybrid. So that will let us know who wants to continue distance learning. So I'll just use you as an example. If, if you're okay with your child going whatever designated days we decide on for, let's say just group A, I'm just gonna make that up, okay? You've not been assigned by the way. If you have, I don't know, okay? <laughs> but if you were okay with that, then you wouldn't need to call. And, but if you said, you know, hey, that's not gonna work out for me. I've already got something worked out. We're gonna continue with distance learning. We would have you call. Now we thought about doing a survey as well, but Mr. Simpson um, felt like that if we're already asking parents to call, two different things may be confusing. And what we really need to know is who's not going to arrive at school on those designated days. Otherwise, you know, and, and we know that we're gonna get a lot of phone calls and we know we're gonna get a lot of questions. And we're going to need our staff with with those designations in front of them so that they can answer those questions and you know we we can meet as a leadership team often to update like those frequently asked questions in the event of um, on a side note i do have some fellow superintendents around the state their elementaries are going every day full force and their high school and middle schools are doing A, B because they know just how important, you know, those, those little ones are, especially in regards to reading. So um, I don't know that I'm ready to do that just yet. Um, but again, it, it, it's gonna depend on the numbers. I mean, if we cannot safely have school, then we're not gonna have school. No different if the roads were slick or we had flooding we're not going to have school. So we're going to have school. <laughs> it's just going to be, it would be a distance learning day or an NTI. Um, I have a question about how we define household. I come from what is probably now an all American family. I have two full blooded brothers. I have two half brothers. I have two step brothers and a stepsister. And so I don't know, you know, the true definition of household. But if all of me and my siblings were still school age, there may be the potential for, you know, custody, the place where those children are to be shifting on any given day. So is our definition of a household just the children who live in a house together or are we looking at blended families? Well, we are looking at blended families because I can, I can say that about my family you know, but they, they live with me, but there are cases where there are, there's shared custody issues. Now, superintendents have shared with me that when they divide up, for the most part, they're getting within about a 15 to 20 household that it work, that doesn't work. And so then you have to go through and hand a sign. 
So, um, but I know that Mr. Lyons has been working closely with Ms. Ms. Farmer, so I, I, I want to make sure that I'm That's speaking correct. correctly. The, um, the households are, uh, each household has a unique identified number, and it does take into account all of those relationships. So it is, of course, dependent upon how clean our data is and when, what they put in for their online registration. So if they registered all those kids under that household, it'll be identified as a single household, and then that will be what it will we'll break it down to. It will also, I found this out today, not only will it divide out sort of so it balances, but it will actually go for secondary classes, it will go into the section courses so that those section courses are also balanced in the classroom. So a teacher on on a B day will have roughly the same number of students on a on a, on a B day. If that makes sense on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday. So that's it's just Campus has built these functions in this year because of the, the emergency. Um, and do we have any idea what distance learning days will look like for students? I know that we're working with the company to provide the tracking cameras, but we most certainly won't have one for every classroom in our district. And I can understand why those superintendents are doing what they're doing with regard to sending elementary school students every day and then middle and high school doing a hybrid because what my concern is as the parent of two elementary school students is that we will be moving from a system where they get four days of really engaging distance learning to two days of in-person instruction during a week and three days of non-traditional instruction assignments. And while those are still reinforcing what they're learning it's not the same as what they're getting in those those live lessons and so i don't know if the benefit of a hybrid schedule outweighs that if that's what we're looking at for our younger children what my hope was is that there would be two days that a child would participate face to face and then there would be two days of what you have currently been participating in, which is distance learning. So they would still be participating in either a sitting in a classroom face to face, or they would be at the computer and their teacher would be teaching like they had been before. And then I do think we need to continue with the one day of NTI for our staff as well as parents. And so that, is what I am thinking okay. is that you would your your kiddos would still get those four days of instruction um, and let's say that your kids decided not to come and they just wanted to keep their four days they're going to get those four days of distance learning like before the teacher would just be in the classroom and, and in some instances our teachers are in the classroom or some they're, they're sitting at you know uh, their home office that they have created. And, and again, I think our teachers have done a great job of creating those home offices or, or getting in the school when they can. And so that is that is what I would like to do. And I, I appreciate that that's our aim for sure. I think when we talked about going, giving families the option to come in person in the fall versus distance learning, our aim was that we would have teachers maybe assigned to in-person learners and teachers assigned to distance learners. And we didn't see that in reality across, you know, across our entire district. So my, again, my concern is that while we have a very specific aim of making sure that those distance learning days are still just as engaging as they are now, what does it look like in reality um, with what our teachers are capable of doing in the classroom? So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big one. Um, a, very, a big concern for me. I also wonder about, I know that other districts that are doing the hybrid option with teachers who have children in the school district, um, you know, if their children are assigned to an A day, a day or an, a B day, are we going to look at the possibility of allowing our teachers' children to attend four days a week so that we don't create kind of a child care issue with our teachers? Or are we looking at potential child care offerings in the school district for teachers children um, because I know that you know some may think about okay well these are the two days I can be here in person because my child is in school in person but am I going to need to take either personal days for the other two days a week or figure out a situation where I'm teaching from home because my child's at home right my children are at home right what I shared with our leadership team because our principals asked the same question 
is that um, I would be flexible and I think the principals will be as well, is that if you are teaching um, and you've got A days, B days, obviously, and your children can come to school with you just like they do on a distance learning day or an NTI day, and that would not interfere with, with teaching, that they would be welcomed in that classroom. Um, now, obviously there's a difference between if you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old than if you have a seven-year-old versus if you have a 15-year-old. Obviously, if you have a 15-year-old home, you're, you feel more comfortable letting them stay home by themselves. So, you know, I want to work with our staff and make them feel comfortable with their child care as well. So, yes, I would be willing, um, you know, that they could come with them um, to school. You know, if I'm teaching algebra two and my kiddos are going to school on Monday or Thursday or Monday, Tuesday, whatever we decide is going to work best for us, um, then maybe on the opposite days they would actually come with me and they're going to have their Chromebook and they're going to get their their assignments as well. So again, like you said, you know, we're just trying to plan and uh, what you think happens, you know, what's intended, you know, what's intended versus reality. You know, I understand that. Um, just would love to get you know, some more kiddos in the building, if possible. Um, our document also says that we will attempt to continue to provide meal service for our family. Um, attempt makes me a little nervous because it means that we can opt not to provide meal service for families who are on distance learning. So can, can we find out a little bit why we did, we will attempt to rather than we will continue to. I think that would be uh, an instance where like this week, we have an entire cafeteria that is quarantined. So I think, you know, we, we fix that. Uh, we just don't want to say that we absolutely are going to be able to provide something when, in, when, when something like that could happen. I don't foresee that being an issue, um, but just, just in the event that, you know, we couldn't, uh, you know, we could not, hand out food at West Marion. We had to move that to Mary County Middle School. So I'm going to say that's the reason that we stated it that way. Okay. And I, I think my thing on it is we're going to have cafeteria staff who are responsible for feeding children in the building. And so are they going to have, are there, there are never enough hours in the day. So are there going to be enough hours in their day to feed the children that are there, but also to put together meals for those pickup services that families can come and pick up? And what we are hoping to do, or we're, what we're planning on doing, is the day that we do an NTI day would be the day that we would provide the meals. It would be fewer meals uh, for those kids that are actually there. Miss um, Wheeler has assured me that she's talked to the, the, the supervisors of each kitchen and they feel comfortable that they can do that. Um, obviously, uh, we can always bring in additional um, subs or even uh, some of our folks in some other positions, especially like transportation that, that want to help with that as well. I mean, I, I trust her leadership and, uh, and, and the leadership of the cafeteria staff. I mean, that was one of the very first things we talked about is how can we continue if we did something completely different, how's that going to work? Can we still provide meals? Because we know that's very important. Uh, uh, like somebody just told me that every time something changes and shuts down, like Miss Wheeler said, and then another parent said something, but you know, every time that something changes, then maybe you have an increased number of people that show up to get those meals. So, can I say something on top of that? Carrie had talked about teachers, you know, bringing their kids and stuff. I want to be ensured that all staff, not just teachers who have that issue also can bring theirs um, children. Cause I was kind of, go you were going in and out, but I wanted to make sure that we were talking about all staff, not just the teachers. Right, I just, I just, that's, that's, I misspoke. I should have said staff and not teachers. I apologize. Any other questions, Ms. Truitt? 
Do you all have any questions or comments for Mr. Simpson? Um, he sit here with us and um, <laughs> for several hours, but um, he's always a part of the conversation. And I think he does a fantastic job with the district of helping us communicate. And, and again, if you all were to approve this, please let families know that this is just another option that could happen. Um, you know, I've been told that there are districts that have called families to say, Mr. Lee, your household A, but yet they, they have not gone into this hybrid mode, but you at least know what your mode or, you know, what, what your group is assigned to. So again, it's just, a, it's just another option. I would like to be able to take advantage of it if we can't get out of red. Maybe we get out of red and go to orange and we can go back full force. Maybe we can all get a vaccine. So it's just nice to have some flexibility and try, maybe. One question I have is, okay. uh, you know, say in like the next coming weeks, or how quickly would we be able to implement this like revised plan if we decided you know, we throw the, the hybrid option there. How, what's the time frame that it would take to be able to activate that? Miss Miss Farmer is is ready if the board approves the plan to go ahead and get groups assigned. So then we would spend tomorrow looking over those. If there's any that we have to do by hand, then we could make the phone call as early as next Tuesday. The reason I say next Tuesday, when I say make the call, that would be the assignment. I don't want to do that on a Friday um, because remember we're not in school on Monday. And if, if we're gonna make that kind of call, we've got to be on standby with the phones when they ring, we gotta answer them. And so, you know, that would that would give us potentially four days to prepare for that both as a family and as a school, because again, I you know, I wanna provide something that's safe, I wanna be able to answer questions. So just like normal, we're going to wait and see what our numbers look like on Thursday and then make a decision about the next week. Um, hopefully we're, we're at a plateau. Hopefully we've gotten over this Christmas and New Year's um, holiday and we can see these numbers coming down um, is what, what I'm hoping. Could be, could be that we could, could start something different as soon as the 25th. Or maybe we go back all together the 25th. I definitely want to talk to um, our MCEA reps and some teachers in our buildings to talk with them about what's comfortable. They may say to me they want all the elementary kiddos back. They may say they don't want our elementary kiddos to do AB. Um, there's going to be pros and cons regardless of the decision. Any other questions? Um, well, just since Mr. Simpson's been here, you know, the big the big change is obviously the inclusion of the hybrid plan. Are there any other changes that we may not be seeing because we're focusing on hybrid that he wanted to point out or talk about or uh, tell us about? Uh, no significant changes. Um, when I added that language regarding the hybrid plan, I believe you'll see that on uh, page four if you have that document. Um, and then another um, sort of an extended definition of what that will mean on page five. Those are the two, only two um, major edits to that document. Uh, there are a few other uh, small things, some broken links uh, throughout it that I found just because I had edited it in some time, but no, no other um, significant changes. Thanks. Ms. Downs, do you have any other questions? I'm good. Thank you. you all, all the questions were asked. <laughs> well, if uh, if nothing else, the pandemic has inspired a lot of creativity. <laughs> it certainly helped us sharpen our problem solving skills. Uh, and I think that after working with Ms. Slosser, Ms. Ben Mr. Benningfield, and all of the leadership team, the principals, I think the community can rest assured that there's no group of folks that want to get kids back in the buildings and back in front of teachers live and in person than this group. They are trying to think of every possible way to make this happen. I know people in the community want it to happen. 
the kiddos want it to happen. And, and so, you know, we're working together to try to, but as Ms. Slosser said, we're not going to do it if it's not safe. And, and, and so I just want the community to know that these, you know, these people, these leadership group, they want the kiddos in the buildings. And I know they're trying uh, to figure out a way to make that happen. My question is, you know, this thing changes, evolves. I mean, you know, just, you might have one school that maybe we have enough staff to have kid, have students in person at almost every building but one, but can we adapt a model that they do distance learning that week or whatever, or whatever, you know, that's just one example, but whatever the situation presents, does this plan give you the flexibility to be able to make adjustments, you know, provided there's no change to the calendar or what have you, but, you know, I just, as you know, from my, you know, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but, but, you know, I would like, I would like to, you know, position it where you you and your team have the autonomy to adjust on the fly because this thing changes on the fly without, because I don't want to be, I don't want to knock us out of being able to go in person because you're waiting on board approval or a vote or what have you. So that's my question. And maybe Mr. Simpson can, can uh, elaborate on this too, but does this, will this approval give you guys what you need to do to be able to make adjustments and, and proceed as needed? I think it will, and, and I, I think you brought up a good point. There may be instances where a school must do distance learning because that particular school has so many folks affected by COVID. And, um, you know, that's probably wouldn't be popular, um, but it might be necessary. Um, but yes, we, we, we could do that. And I, I think that was written into the plan from the beginning. Am I correct, Mr. Sampson, that some schools could go, some couldn't go. Um, but you know, I, and, and I know that, I know that, that folks are frustrated because they see that other districts close by are doing this hybrid. Maybe, maybe they, um, you know, did that. That's something I did not. I, I, I just, it's something I didn't want to do because I know it's really tough on staff and it's tough on parents. But goodness, I never thought we would be in the middle of January and we would not be back. And, you know, with, with this vaccine dilemma, I'm just trying to think of ways, you know, I just don't, there's not any, there's not any fix to this. This is way beyond what you all can do and what I can do. So really and, and even approving this plan, it is really still all contingent upon we had the staff to be able to put this into practice. Right. right. And, and 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 just and just want folks to know, you know, if, if they have COVID or they're exposed, they're not they're not choosing not to come to work. I mean they they can't come to work. If a staff member has a pre-existing condition way before this ever came out, and they are more susceptible to this, this virus, we're gonna provide accommodations. They may be teaching from home, but we're gonna make sure that they're safe. And, and I know that that's something that you want me to be asked as well. I had a conversation through text message with a, with a teacher this week, and they were nervous and upset. I said, just breathe, you know, we'll make a decision, and that's what we're here for. We, we are here to make sure that our families feel safe, our kids feel safe, and our staff feels safe. So we want to talk to them and find out, um, you know, their concerns. So you're right, you're right. Um, but when the health department calls and they say they're quarantined, you got to stay home. Yeah. It's just, it's There's no way around it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I sincerely appreciate the, that we're considering every available <coughs> option. I've got significant concerns about making the shift and the possibility of starting hybrid on the 25th that seems incredibly fast um, for families for teachers um, I am a parent at home working full-time and trying to manage the education of three children I in thinking about having two days a week where my kids are in school it sounds like heaven on earth because <laughs> my brain can be just in four different pieces instead of seven um, but it does just making this major shift 
and it is a major shift. It's not simply adding a paragraph to a plan. It's a major shift in how we've been offering education uh, for this time. I want to give our families and our staff adequate time to figure out how it will work in reality versus how what our aim is, because I think our aims are wonderful and they sound great, but is that truly what we're gonna experience in reality? Because when I think about a second grade teacher having 10 kids in their classroom and then sitting at a desk, staying here and not moving about the classroom, that doesn't feel realistic to me. Um, so, you know, I know that it's just an option and I know that it's flexibility that we're trying to add. Um, but the reality of, of what it, it looks like for families and for teachers um, is significant and not easy, not easily accomplished, even by this amazing and incredible team who has become incredibly adept at shifting focus for a while now. So, um, but I do appreciate the, the continued search for flexibility. I mean, we've all got to be flexible in this, so. And, and we, I promise that we will listen and make sure that if that's the decision that we're, that we made, that, that we feel that the folks that are going to come back and the staff that's going to be doing that um, are as comfortable as they can be. You know, I'm, I'm not just going to make the decision because I can. You know, I want, I want it to try to be the best that we've got under the current circumstances. And I, I, it's just it's just tough, like you said. Mm -hmm. Mr. The, Lee? The document that we have that was sent to us. Yes. Is that, on, is that available on this website? Yes. So that we can refer, so I will post it so that they can refer to this and read over it. Okay. Yes. It, it is posted or it will be? It is posted. It, the revised uh, will be posted once you all agree. Okay. Don't want to ever post anything that's going to be something that, you know, I don't, I don't want to okay. assume anything. Okay, any other questions? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Need a motion for 4F. Make a motion to consider approval of MCHS graduation day. Second. Any questions or comments? What is that day? <laughs> It is going to be uh, Mr. Peterson and the site based council has asked that we approve that to be held at noon on May the 29th on Saturday, which is typically what um, Marion County does. We do it. We do a Saturday afternoon graduation. Gives folks time to celebrate afterwards and then come back and have project graduation. Fingers crossed that's something we can do this year. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, item 4G, first reading of the 21-22 school calendar. You just need to acknowledge that, correct? Yes. Do you all have any questions for Mr. Lyons about the 21-22 School calendar. It's 2122. <laughs> I don't have any questions, do you? Uh, the big change was the removal of early early release days, correct? Uh, yeah, Mr. Eubank can attest to the fact that early release days were not very popular with the committee um, for the most part. So, um, and um, yeah, that's about the most, that's about the most, other than that, it's pretty close to what we have now. We did get a lot of positive feedback though on a full day that I think we're going to have the, the Monday post fall break. And we got good feedback from principals and staff to, for that as well. So I, we, we chose a full day instead of multiple half days. Yeah, so when we did the we did the early release day, we went to 175 instruction days. So if I go into a full day, that drops us to 174. If we lose instruction day, we would get a full day, which they thought would be more meaningful. And I know one of the questions that Mr. Lee asked me is, is with this pandemic and kids being out of school, how are we going to monitor where kids are and our instructional coaches um, and, and our, our 
teachers and things, they really like the idea if we get kids back in school like normal next year, we do our assessments, we use that Otis program that you all support, and we can use that day after fall break as like a data review day. And so we can really zero in on how we can support kids and accelerate kids and, and different things like that. So thank you for serving. I, I know there's not a lot, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot, but we're kind of bound by, by certain things. So appreciate you because I know you can do that as a parent and also with business and industry as well. Um, I know that one thing that was brought up, uh, not this school year, but next, maybe we look at using the second week of either fall break or spring break because HR folks don't have the opportunity to take off with their children because they're, they're closing out a month and, and things like that. And so uh, we're, we're gonna take that into consideration and just also wanna let you all know that Washington County has not put out a calendar yet for the next school year. I know that's always something that we consider because we share students at the ATC. And then in some cases, when we have an opportunity, send them over to their some of their programs. Not a lot of kids, but it does affect some and they're all important. Yeah, we, we, we did consult with Washington County before, especially on the, uh, with the start date, so yeah. we're kind of being the punch. <laughs> there must not have been any students on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, questions on the calendar? Okay, moving on to item five, need a motion for 5A. I make a motion to consider approval of the 2021-2022 draft budget. Second. Any questions on the draft budget? We'll have work sessions. This or is a work sessions at some point. This is just the initial uh, beginning of the budget process and then uh, we'll get to work sessions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There'll be a lot more to come with that. So if, if you all can approve this tonight, then we can get started and, and start working on what that's going to really look like uh, to impact uh, school supplies, programs, staffing, all those kinds of things. Uh, just as a reminder, our staffing allocations are due to our schools by March 1. Uh, so uh, let, let's try to plan on trying to get together between now and maybe mid-February, you think, Mr. Pennyfield, mid-February, because that's going to give us an idea of what those allocations are going to look like. And it also uh, dictates their school supply money as well as uh, their, their teacher allocations as well. That would help our office. And then it kind of falls right in line of, of, of different things that are required in, in HR work. So, um. okay. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, need a motion for item 6A through 6F student learning and support continuum. I make a motion we approve all student learning and support consent items uh, 6A through F. Second. Any questions on any of those items or comments on any of those items? I have yeah. one. Um, on uh, approval of school fundraisers, uh, are they allowed to have meals within the lunchroom now or how, how would that work? With the, I think it was a chili supper fundraiser. It would actually be a drive-through. To go. To it go. would be like a to-go drive-through. Gotcha. Unless something changes right away. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Mr. Lee, no, I just want to say thanks to uh, you know, Morgan Electric for their donation, as well as Terry Doty with South Central Kentucky Roofing, as well as Kentucky Cooperage. We appreciate appreciate the donations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We are very fortunate to have a wonderful community that supports what we're doing. Absolutely. Okay, any other comments? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, 
Item seven, acknowledgement of personnel actions. So acknowledged. And I don't know if Ms. Lowry is still with us, but if she's not, she clicks on the YouTube video tomorrow and sees three hours plus. <laughs> <laughs> it is not going to make her day. <laughs> She's been tuning in lately. Her, her Instagram stories that accompany our meetings. <laughs> okay, need a motion for adjournment. Motion. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, meeting adjourned. Ooh. Everybody have a nice weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Hope that'll be all the stuff.